I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. I'm a behavior expert, did 20 years in the U.S. military, published a number one best-selling book on influence, persuasion, and people reading, and I teach corporate America and the general public today. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together this bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street and in corporate America. Excellent. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, somebody who keeps we every time we put a video out, we get at least I don't know how many we get people saying do Patsy Ramsey. Let's hear about the Ramseys. Do it. Talk about John Bonet. So we're going to do that today. So it's it's come to the point where we can't put it off any longer. So today we're going to talk about uh, we're going to take a look at Patsy Ramsey. Greg, you're the one that found the video we're going to use. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, and there's some irony to this. I'm going to almost be a cold reading today because I found this video a few months ago when people kept harassing us for this one. And this is a this video is from 2000, so a few years after the John Bonet Ramsey murder. And they've released a book, and they're back in front of the cameras. And I, I think it speaks for itself. Past that, this has become the hottest one we constantly get asked for. I honestly don't find it as interesting as other cases often. But when other people ask for it, I think it's good for us to all spend our time looking at this. And if you don't know this case, this is one of those long running cases no one has ever figured out. Nobody knows what happened exactly on that Christmas day or Christmas Eve. So it's a timely one. I think it'll always be around and people will always be conjecturing. What we don't plan to do is say, this is what happened. It was, you know, Colonel Mustard in the, in the study. We're not going to do that kind of thing. We're just going to tell you what we see. We're not going to say she's guilty or innocent. We're going to say what we think in terms of this. We're not trying to be the court here. There's way too many people looked at this case. This is the behavior panel's opinion of what we see in Patsy. Excellent. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to listen to the 911 call because that a lot of it's centered around that. There are two parts to it. The first part is the 911 call itself. And then we're going to listen to the last part of it, which we won't hear in this first video. But we'll hear it again later where it, it was questionable about what went on in there. So... Here we go. Police! What's going on? 555 15th Street. What's going on there, ma'am? We have a kidnapping. All right, please. Can you explain to me what's going on, okay? There, we have a. There's a note left, and our daughter's gone. A note was left, and your daughter is yes. gone? How old is your daughter? She's six years old. She's blonde. Six years old. How long ago was it? I don't know. I just found the note. And my daughter's gone. Does it say who took her? What? Does it say who took her? No, I don't know. It's, there's, a, there's a ransom note here. It's a ransom note? It says SBTC. Victory. Please. Okay, what's your name? Are you Kathy Matt? Ramsey? I'm the mother. Oh my God. Please. I'm Okay, I'm sending an officer over, okay? Please. Do you know how long she's been gone? No, I don't. Please, we just got out and she's right here. Oh my God, please. Okay, please, well, there's somebody. I am, honey. Please. Take a deep breath. Please, hurry, okay. hurry, hurry. Patsy, 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 Patsy. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, guys, I'm always talking about 911 calls. They're among my favorite things because when a person has a true emergency, they're there to tell you the story and get as much information to you as possible. I need you at my address right now for this problem. I need police to look for my daughter. Not, please, please, not telling you their story, but telling you the story, usually responding to prompts. Now, people can be hysterical. If you lose a child, if something happens, you're going to be hysterical. But you typically don't control release information. Control release of information sounds like storytelling. Mark, you talk about storytelling a hell of a lot on these things. And this is storytelling. It feels awkward to me. And all this HBTC victory, who cares about any of that? Who cares what's in the note? What you want is the police right now. You're beginning to release a story. And those are typically alibis when you're doing that. So this is a red flag conversation for me. Never mind all the, it feels like bad acting to me. Now, I, I'm not in her situation. I can't say what she's normally like. I don't see her enough. But this looks like telling her, her story, not the story. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to replay that and I want you to breathe along with uh, the, the caller there because what I want you to see is whether you can sustain that level of breathing in, out, in, out. It's pretty rapid. So it, it's real panic breathing. But can you sustain it without giving up and going, wow, I'm going to fall over, I'm going to faint? Because here's the thing. That level of breathing, without having an adrenaline, you would stop. So here's what I'm going to say. That's real panic breathing from this person. There must be some adrenaline in the system. There's some kind of real panic going on because otherwise she wouldn't be able to breathe like that for so long, I would suggest. And I've tried this again and again and again with lots of performers. You know, how do you do panic and do it take after take after take after take and not collapse, fall over, forget the words that you've got. Uh, you have to have a, some adrenaline going through your system to burn up that uh, that oxygen. So real panic going on here. Now, I don't know why there's real panic going on. I can think of a whole bunch of reasons. I don't know why, but it's 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 uh, there's something real emotional going on there. Uh, again, heightened emotions are very, very difficult to sustain. Most of the heightened emotions you've ever had, you won't have been able to sustain them for more than about 10 minutes. And very quickly, you will have peaked, you'll have found your, your body start to get tingly, your legs start to go from underneath you. So again, breathe along to that uh, video and see how long you can sustain it for there's something real going on there um scott what do you got hey greg yeah we can't see you but I know. I are, are you, are you about to waterboard us greg i turned it off and said <laughs> i had to go move something <laughs> oh i had to move something, something i always get uh, i always get worried when it all goes a dark piece of felt goes over my just, head like that and greg's yeah, in just the room. slowly it's very slowly worrying surely don't do that to me yeah <laughs> okay you ready all right. Well, here's what I got. That's Greg and I did a whole that which this is from from our um, course, um, the True Crime Workshop dot com, mm -hmm. and so we've studied these some of these things. And this one I've, I've been able to spend a little time with. And like Greg was saying earlier, there are specific things you say when you're in a panic, when you're calling nine one one. You're calling the people that are going to help you the quickest and the fastest and get there to get you as much help as possible. Two or three things for me lit up in here right out of the gate. She says the right thing. She gives her address. That's the first thing she does. Usually you'll hear that when cops call, when police officers call, they'll say, the first thing they'll say is the address and they'll say uh, our house is on fire or whatever the, whatever the problem is. But then in this case, when there's a kidnapping, she wouldn't have said, we have a kidnapping. Nobody says that. She would have said, my daughter's gone. My, my baby's gone. Somebody's got my kid. Something like that. And then when she would ask questions and there was a, you know, there was a note. It takes her a minute to get to the part where she says a ransom, a ransom note, but she makes sure to say that, which means she's read it. So that that part of it is is a little bit iffy for me. The um, I don't think she would have hung up at the end. I don't. Th I, th I think she would have kept talking and trying to communicate and find out when this help is coming because she's saying, "Please, please, please help me get this." There's a there's a nine one one call we have in this course where the woman has. Um, her children have, have been have been killed oh, and she's God. screaming just like the, the Patsy Ram Ramsey is screaming there toward the end when she goes, oh, my God, I think what's firing her adrenaline off there, Mark, is the fact that she's as she's doing this, she's realizing the the depth of, of, of the situation of where they are in it. And I think that's what's helping fire off her, her adrenaline to get her excited as she moves forward through that that her communication with the 911. A dispatcher. So I think that that's the that's what we're hearing there. We are hearing some panic because when that happens, you've got to lean into it. Like this is, and I think your body, even even with a lot of actors, they'll go ahead and lean on into the panic mode. And I think that's what that's what we're hearing at this point. But I think she would have stayed on. I don't think she would have just hung up. I think she would have kept talking to her until they showed up. I don't think she would have hung up at this. So those those are a few things in there that bother me. Chase, what do you got? So let's just talk about language here. You guys covered a lot. If your house was burning, would you report, we've got a fire? Or we have a gas fire? And would you say, I found the ransom note? Or would you say, I found a ransom note? Let's say you found something insignificant. You're staying in a hotel and there's a cockroach in your room and you call the front desk. You're not going to say, I found the cockroach in my room. <laughs> the word the 
suggests familiarity with the other person. If I say, I'm going to meet you at the restaurant, you will have to know exactly what I mean. And I think it's subconsciously was a way for her to imply familiarity and understanding with the situation. Excellent. Okay. Any cockroaches in your Jamaican hotel, Chase? So far, no. I'm in uh, Tower Isle, Jamaica right now, and uh, it's, it's been good. I don't have I'll, I'll bet if you find a cockroach, it'll be a very specific message. <laughs> <laughs> it will be a cockroach. Yeah. <laughs> if it's on the beach, it would be nude. Am I correct about that? Yes, I think. All the cockroaches are nude here. Okay, good, good. All right, let's move along. Lovely. said no footprints in the snow and we have seen photographs that were taken the morning of the 26th by the police by the police of each of the door entries and around the house and there was no snow urban myth all right chase what do you got there are what i describe in my training we, we've talked before about something called a confirmation glance. If you're looking at an accomplice, you'll probably do it before you answer. If you're looking at two interrogators, you'll probably do it after you answer. But there are five ways you can look at someone that's with you in a conversation to gain something from that person. And they spell out the word crash. The first one is confirmation. It says, I want the other person to nod. The next is relief. Somebody speaks for us and we're glad that they took the opportunity. The next is approval. I'm requesting for the other person to nod or affirm what I'm doing. Then we have suggestion, and this is a request for the, them to continue for me or add some details for me. And finally is help, spelling out crash. H is help. And this is requesting for rescue. And things have gone south in the conversation. I need, I need a bailout. I need a mulligan here. I need you to help me out. And we see this relief glance in this. The moment that his wife speaks, starts speaking to answer the question, we see this relief in his face that somebody else has answered it. And I think it's interesting. There's a strong chin raise in this woman's face by when she's saying by the police. And her statement is kind of showing a little indignation and welcoming a challenge. This is what we do when we want to challenge another primate and expose these vital organs. We see it in bar fights even. Drunk people throw their, their chin up and their arms out. I think that's interesting. And right at the end of the clip, we're starting to uh, see something called a pre-swallow movement, where this throat is starting to go up as a result of a saliva dump into the mouth. All in, I think there is, there's a few credibility issues with the statement. Scott, what do you got? All right. We're see, I agree with you 100 percent. I didn't catch that swallow thing, though. Fascinating. Um, <clears throat> here we see her heads tilted as she's talking. When people if you say you're playing poker, when poker players are playing, they'll when they do this and they expose that side of their neck and they get that head back, that denotes and indicates confidence. So here she's she's giving information that she knows or that she believes to be true. And she's sort of like sticking it up this 
interviewers because from you can tell her i would suggest her attitude would be more of a holier than thou at that point because she's almost like i've got a huge nose so i can talk about noses she's almost looking down her nose at that at her as she's as you're saying that as her head goes back um and the tone of voice is that dominant tone of voice you use when you're talking to a child or you're or, or you're or you're mad at someone and you're you're saying well i'll tell you what i do know and the same thing with her we'll see as we go along her her um illustrators get larger as we go illustrators are the ways your brain um it, it focuses on specific words it emphasizes specific words or phrases just like i did then i did then and so we're seeing a lot of that and it gets more uh, predominant as we go along but the 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 longer it goes the, the more into it she gets of being more dominant over this person and we'll we'll talk about some other things that i'm sure everybody's caught them as we go through this where she's being that way as well. Mark? Yeah, so arrogance, condescension, we see exactly as been said there. The chin comes up, which means she ends up, ends up looking down the nose in condescension. That's the over display of kill points on the body in close proximity, basically saying you have no power. I don't think you would strike, or if you did strike, I don't think it would have any effect on me. So she's wanting to display power at this point. I think that's because she's wanting to recontrol the story, their story. This is about them getting their story out. And so she uses this idea of their, how forceful she, she is. There was no snow. Um, I almost said it there, fake news. She says, um, but instead she says urban myth. And urban myth was the kind of 80s, 90s version of fake news. She's saying everybody else has controlled this narrative. They've made up stories about this. Now I'm taking control of the story. This is our story. So I think that's what people don't let. This is well, my first indicator of she's not a very likable person in this situation because she wants to assert power. That as a good generalization across many cultures is a, a female asserting power power is is not looked on well it's often look, looked on well by men and women they don't neither like it they want the women to share power but she's taking control of this i'll, I'll show you later on how actually she's very similar to margaret thatcher the uh, the 80s uh, prime minister of the uk very very similar vocal range very very similar gestures as well again not a likable woman by many people at the time so assertion of power assertion of the narrative uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so you guys have gotten almost everything I had. There are a couple of other small things. Number one, you could have just as easily finished this sentence with you stupid twit. <laughs> That's the whole demeanor that she has when she's talking to this woman. It's it's condescending. It's arrogant. It's telling. It's You always talk about that pawing, that pushing down. She's pushing down when she's talking to this person, Mark. And the other piece that she does is she does what I typically refer to authority by association hear her blast police out. She uses that word like it gives her some kind of authority. And we'll hear her again do what I would call holy ground or take some kind of authority figure and use it to validate her story. That's the only thing I saw that you guys haven't mentioned. I mean, great round cover. I think all of this, you're, you're dead on. I, I think when I was watching this, all I could think was letting them eat cake, famous last words. She's condescending. She's looking down her nose and it's hard to like her. And if you don't like her, you're going to look for reasons why she did it. That's what I'll leave this piece at. Okay. Footprints outside the house. No evidence of footprints. I think it said no footprints in the snow. And we have seen photographs that were taken the morning of the 26th. By the police. By the police of each of the door entries and around the house. And there was no snow. Urban myth. Yeah, good. Right, we good? Yeah, all good. Okay. This is Ramsey, the 911 call. <clears throat> there are contradictions about whether or not the phone was hung up and whether or not your son, Burke, came downstairs and was talking. Some police officers believe that they can hear that on an enhanced audio tape. Others say no. What do you say? Well, we have not heard the 911 tape, but we understand from people who have heard it that it sounds like a bunch of chipmunks chattering and that it is almost unintelligible. 
All we know is that Burke did not come downstairs that morning, nor did we say to him, you know, go back, or whatever it is they say that it's said on the 911 tape. I phoned the police, called 911 from the kitchen telephone, wall phone, hung up, dialed one set of our friends, hung up, and dialed another set of friends and asked them to come quickly to help. How soon after that 911 call did you dial the phone? Immediately. Friends? Immediately. So, so it seems to me like if you hang up the phone, you're not going to be able to place another call unless the phone is completely. Look, th this is another, uh, there's been no logic applied to any of this case in my judgment. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So, uh, you know, to your point, uh, often, Scott, this idea of, of loping, what I like about this is her story seems to kind of jump along quite, quite well. It seems kind of Okay. Again, the problem is, I think, for a lot of people, is it just seems a little bit cold. You know, it doesn't have some of that variation. It doesn't have the cracks in the voice of emotion. And yet, at the same time, in terms of, you know, looking for truth, it seems to romp along fairly well. Again, I don't think people like the forthright, aggressive nature of which it lopes along at. I don't think people like her assurity around this because, you know, everybody out there, we've all got ideas about what might have happened here. Uh, first point I pick up here of the, of the, what looks to me like lip grooming. You know, it's a lick of the lips, I would say, in order to say, hey, I'm looking good. I want to look good for this. So it already feels to me like looking good is important to her. And, uh, you know, I know I think her, her daughter was obviously in, in pageants. I think she was in pageants. The idea of looking good and presenting well my guess is is massively important, and that comes across for me in the lip grooming. Um, oh, also this idea of social status and and two sets of friends. So there's this idea of already, you know, I've got my whole crowd involved. I've got lots of friends. They're they're a set as well. Strong social structure and looking good in front of the social structure. That's what I've got out of that. And uh, Chase, I want to go to you. What do you got? Yeah, absolutely agree with you guys. I think there's some indignation at the beginning here with the question. And the mention of the 911 call and the sun coming downstairs produces immediate eye flutter, which I thought pretty telling. And we've not heard the 911 tape. And this is a reassurance and approval glance that we see here. And all we know is that Burke didn't come downstairs. We know nothing else. We know that there was no involvement. The one thing we're certain of is that he did not come downstairs. We know nothing else about anything. He just didn't come downstairs. And I fully agree with Mark. And this is the world that they live in is appearance and image and perception management. So most of her life pageants are about perception management. It's not about true beauty. It's not about a whole lot of other things that they might purport themselves to be perception management is the name of the game. And I think that has bled into many other areas of her life. And we see that here. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think we're seeing some really odd eye, eye blinking behavior here. And this is the first time I've actually ever paid attention to it or I've seen it like this. <clears throat> we do see the eye flutters at the, at the beginning, but when, but she blinks twice Every time when she starts, when she hears um, whether or not the phone was hung up, when the, when the interviewer says that, she blinks twice. When she says, um, so, or your son Bert, Burke came down uh, and was talking, she blinks two times there. And then she says some police officers, officers believe they can hear that on the enhanced audio. She blinks two times there. No other time is she doing two blinks like that. So she may do it a couple other times as we go down the road here. But... And this thing, that seems to almost trigger her double eye blink, which I've never seen that before. That was really, really odd as far as that goes. And I agree with you guys on everything, on everything else. So, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so we always talk about fight or flight increasing blink rate. In this specific case, this is fight. Almost guaranteed. This is not flight. This is how dare you attack me again. I can see it written all over. And the double blink is a condemning double blink, I think. It's the how dare you ask that that again and it's a poke she's she's ready for a fight you can see she's ready for a fight she's not 
she's not backing away from it and looking afraid. She's not, her lips are not getting thin. She's ready for, for going at this person's what I see. When she starts to talk and she's nodding and she's thinking, watch her head slow down. The speed of her nodding slows down as her processor kicks in, as she's thinking about how to answer this question. Love the confirmation glance, love the connect, connecting glance. As she looks over to make connection and think, okay, I'm not alone in this, we're on the same page. And that you guys covered everything else. I think those pieces, Scott, I love the fact that you're catching that double blink. And I think fight or flight makes us blink more rapidly. And I'm a Southern boy, I was raised in the South. I can see a Southern woman looking at me and blinking her eyes twice and saying, oh no, you didn't. I can see that written all over this woman. You know, if, if my grandmother had done something like that, I would have thought, oh, here it comes. Something bad's about to happen to me. So think about the part culture plays because we're all born capable of doing everything the other person's doing. And all culture does is add nuance to those meanings. That's all it does. So when somebody looks at you and goes, that means something. She's done it before and it's, it's a method for her. I see fight or flight and she's after you. That's it. That's all I got. Okay. This is Ramsey, the 911 call. <clears throat> Contradictions about whether or not the phone was hung up and whether or not your son Burke came downstairs and was talking. Some police officers believe that they can hear that on an enhanced audio tape. Others say no. What do you say? Well, we have not heard the 911 tape, but we understand from people who have heard it that it sounds like a bunch of chipmunks chattering and that it is almost unintelligible. All we know is that Burke did not come downstairs that morning, nor did we say to him, you know, go back, or whatever it is they say that it's said on the 911 tape. I phoned the police, called 911 from the kitchen telephone, wall phone, hung up, dialed one set of our friends, hung up, and dialed another set of friends and asked them to come quickly to help. How soon after that 911 call did you dial the phone? Immediately. Place? Immediately. So, so it seems to me like if you hang up the phone, you're not going to be able to place another call unless the phone is completely... Look, th this is another... Uh, there's been no logic applied to any of this case in my judgment. Cool. All right. Here we go. So what we'll do is this. We're going to play this, the last part of the 911 call. We're not going to comment on it. What we want you to do is you talk about it and you tell us what, what you think is being said in this. Because it's really tough to, to make out. I'm hearing one thing... But, but I'm not really even sure what that is. So why don't we do that? We're just going to play this for you. We'll play it. It'll go through three times and you'll listen to that. And then you write what you think it says in the comments. Service. Do you know the results of that test definitively? Mm, no, I don't. I just, no, we had experts do the same kind of testing, and it's my understanding that the people that, that we use trained the people from the CBI, Colorado Bureau, that, that administered the test. And they, on a scale of one to five, with five being absolutely no match, I ranked at a 4.5 with one being a perfect match. So, you know. Yeah, we, don't, we don't know the result. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, when she's nodding yes, she, we, we see her squint when they talk about the Secret Service. Her, she freezes and you see that, that those eyes squint up. So something's there. I don't think she knew that had happened. Because once they say that, once they throw in that jab at her, in other words, she comes back with, um, well, here's what I do know, that I'm not the person that did it, and here's all the proof that tells why. That's what I'm seeing. That, that, that stuck out to me like, uh, you know, like a red flag. But Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, I, I'm on the same page. Watch her pupils. There's a flash in her pupils in this, like you don't get the opportunity to see very often. Her, her pupils go to pinpoint and then back out a little. Um, when she does that squint thing, I'm with you. I think if she really believes that whatever she has, her expert's better than your expert is what she just said. My expert taught your expert. So there, I'll see your expert and raise you another. That, if she really believed that and didn't know about the, the Secret Service doing it, she probably would quickly go, uh oh, there's, there's a piece of data I didn't expect. And the squint is data intake and, and what you call it, fake concern or concern. She's doing data intake. So those are really big things for me. And the other one is, Mark, you brought up last time she's lip grooming. This is not lip grooming. That was a quick jut. That usually is distaste. That usually is disapproval, whatever. You know, it, Desmond Moore said it's our first no. It's how we push a nipple away from our lips. And so it's rejection of an idea, rejection of that. I, it makes me want to talk to her more about the handwriting. And in fact, guys, if you really want to know about the handwriting, there are hours and hours and hours of stuff about her handwriting, about her talking to in a deposition about the handwriting. So you can go and dig into this for yourself and not not just look at what we're doing, the body language. Um, Chase, what do you got? Let's keep in mind, uh, when they're talking about handwriting analysis, they're talking not about graphology, which is right. uh, referred to sometimes as a, as a pseudoscience. They're referring to the characteristic and nature of how letters are constructed and written and whether or not they match someone else, all the way down to pressure of the pen on, on the paper. Great call out. Great call out. Yep. Uh, so right here, she starts out discrediting the evidence instead of making any kind of denial, makes no denial as a matter of fact whatsoever. And she says, it's my understanding. And this is the first thing that uh, any good lawyer is going to teach you to say during an interview. You always say it's my understanding. And you can never be backed into any corner for the rest of your life. And, and I think that's just being used here. And I think it's interesting they would hire people to analyze their own handwriting to begin with. Mark? Yeah. So uh, here's what we see again is this uh, playoff of status there instantly goes to, as Greg was saying, you know, uh, my, my graphologist is better than your graphologist. My graphologist, you know, trained your graphologist. So so kind of almost the resume statement or, or, or resumes at dawn. It's a dueling match is going on immediately. Uh, and here's why I think this is important for our perception of her is it's very aloof and high status. And I think what we want to see is the public from her is sorrow and loss. And she doesn't give us any sorrow and loss. So I think what we need to do as a public kind of watching this is go, what am I really wanting from her? And if she isn't able to give it to me, might I be against her? Might it cause a bias in me? I think her aloofness here easy, easily triggers us into a bias against her because she is a mother. And from a mother, we want to see continued sorrow and loss around this that that's all i've got and oh i will bring up a, a, again as well this idea of the of the urban myth and and the idea that in urban myths in mythology you often get children going missing it's a classic of mythology and also um uh infanticide, you know, parents killing their kids as well. So again, as a public here, we are in this wonderful world of mythology of the most horrible crimes of parents killing kids or, um, or kids just going missing, being taken away by the fairies. So again, we've got to check in with ourselves around this and make sure that mythology isn't biasing us and that we can get to the real truth of what's going on here. Okay, let me leave it at that. Guys, this is gonna be another McCann's for us. People are gonna hate or love us because they made up their mind a thousand years ago and all their evidence is right. There's, their expert's gonna be better than our expert. You know, They're gonna say, this expert said that. So we're gonna see that too. This is a mess. None of us know what happened in this house. And you know, I always say, Somebody says, well, it couldn't be. She couldn't have killed her child because she's not a murderer. And my answer is murder is a crime of passion and people do stupid things. Mrs. Ramsey, it's my understanding that the Colorado Bureau of Investigation took your handwriting samples 
to the Secret Service. Do you know the results of that test? Definitively? Mm, no, I don't. I just, no, we had experts do the same kind of testing, and it's my understanding that the people that, that we used trained the people from the CBI, Colorado Bureau, that they administered the tests. And they, on a scale of one to five, with five being absolutely no match, I ranked at a 4.5, with one being perfect match. So, you know. Yeah, we don't, we don't know the result. And the ransom note was already written? I believe it was. I mean, it's very unusual for a ransom note to, to be this long. I, from what we understand from professionals we've talked with that after someone commits such a crime as this they you know get the heck out of there so. all right mark what do you got yeah so again playing status the idea of this is very unusual this is very unique this is very very special uh so again this idea of the status coming forward here's what triggers me around this furrowed brow lots of helpfulness lots of confusion uh lots of expertise where you maybe shouldn't have any expertise i think we've seen this time and time again with people who we know are not telling the truth. It's a usual trope of, I'm gonna be very, very concerned, really helpful, a little bit confused, and actually quite knowledgeable about things that I really shouldn't be. Four or five big red flags come up for me at this moment, probably the most concerning moment of, of all of these videos for me. Uh, Chase, what do you got? We have another great case of the missing perpetrator. Everyone here has talked to somebody who's done some stupid or bad stuff. And in nine out of 10 of those cases, those people don't want to talk about the one who committed it. They don't want to talk about the perpetrator who did this. And as the video starts or as this clip starts, we see some false confusion, but it's confusion for agreement. It's I'm looking confused with my face in hopes that it becomes contagious to the other person. And when she says someone, did this, not kidnapper, not murderer, not potential rapist. It's someone. And when she says such a crime as this, it's not any of the harsh words, kill or murder or whatever else we could, we could be saying. If that happens to a person's family member, there is a 99.9% .9 chance they have no problem and they are even very vocal about using that word to evoke emotion out of the person listening to them. If you think about the phrase, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, the same thing happens. Instead of saying sex, we change it to sexual relations. And when she says at the very end, get the heck out of here, she actually does with her eyes. She escapes the conversation as fast as she possibly can and hopes for a subject change. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, this one kind of bothers me too, because when she says, um, or after she says in the ransom note was already written and she uses what I call fading facts, she starts getting quieter and quieter. The further along she goes, the quieter she gets as she goes. Like, then she's, when she says, uh, in a crime such as this, when she's explaining, her head goes down to guard her neck because her neck, is, as, as up to this point we've seen a lot of times, has been up. Going back to the when she was talking about the 911 call earlier, we saw it go down and guard a lot. It was bouncing around and it, it guarded a lot down there when, when it was talking about if she had her involvement in it in, in the, the second part of the uh, call. But um, when she says a crime such as this, that head comes back down and, and, and guards the neck. And then again, she continues to speak quietly as she goes along. So this 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 shouts to me some guilty knowledge. Something's not right. Something's not right here. Something's not right here. Greg, what do you got? I'll add a few more sprinkles on what you guys have already said. Too much eye contact. Way, way too much eye contact. Mesmerizing eye contact. She breaks eye contact at the end, yes, but during this time, even when she's stammering as she's admitting that this was an unusual ransom note, which is probably a point that people are using to establish guilt, usually a ransom note would say, hey, give me some money, I got your kid. 
You know, it wouldn't say, you know, um, victory to the whatever she said. That's not usually what you expect. You don't expect three pages. You also, if you did something and it has become the place that is the most scrutiny and you wrote a three page thing, you're giving a real handwriting sample on a level nobody has ever done. And now they can compare it and they go look at your work. Now you, you probably are feeling a little dumb about that. So you may stammer and stutter your way through it. Way too much eye contact. She's almost trying to give you a, we will never find this guy because this is such an unusual thing. And, and I, I, this is just sprinkles on everything you guys said. I agree. All these pieces around distancing and all that. Usually a person would say, whatever scumbag took my kid, I want their head. That's the way they approach it. Yeah. Now, a lot of this is just her personality, all that stuff. But the chin down and all this together, you should have a pretty good picture that we're all concerned here. Yeah. That's it. All right. And the ransom note was already written. I believe it was. I mean, it's very unusual for a ransom note to, to be this long. I, from what we understand from professionals we've talked with, that after someone commits such a crime as this, they, you know, get the heck out of there. So. Cool. We good? Yeah. Let's move along. What about that, Mrs. Ramsey? Yeah. Um, your child's been killed brutally, and then someone writes out this ransom note. Why do you think that that's not feasible? Why do you think it was written before? Because I have been told by people who are experienced in this field that that is usually the way it happens. I have no previous knowledge about these kind of things, but we have been you know, in conversation and in, in, uh, we think about this every day, every day. And we've sought out, you know, the top people in the field that know about how the criminal mind works. And this is what we're, we're going on. The profile that's in the book, you know, all of that information is not from John and from me. This is from, from people that know what they're doing. All right, Chase, what do you got? If you're watching this, do me the biggest favor of all time and watch this clip and only listen to her responses and see if somebody offered you a million dollars to figure out what she's talking about, if you could figure it out. This is the most generalized, non-specific, non-committal answer I've ever heard in any interview, I think in my lifetime. It's pe those people, these people, these techniques, this agency, those agencies, these people, all arguments are arguments from authority or an argument on authority. So if you told me, oh, I think she's on drugs and I, my response would be, oh, where did you graduate pharmacology school? That's the argument of authority. And what, what they're doing is something called borrowing authority. So I am borrowing the authority of another agency or another group of people in order to make my story more believable or more palatable for people to like me more, which certainly lead to maybe an innocent claim at the end, but it would certainly lead to where I want somebody to start believing I'm going to wind up. Uh, Greg. Yeah. What you call borrowing authority, I call authority by association. And she doesn't just borrow it. She paid for it. She tells you, we have the experts. There's a status claim here, and there's a resume statement of sorts there, I would say. I paid for this expertise, and I know. So I agree with you. There's that, certainly, up front. She swallows really hard at the beginning of this. Did you all see that? Just the awkward. Now, it's probably from the question before, but it's still there. She smiles awkwardly in the middle of this thing. I don't get that. Of all the things, it's kind of that condescending smile. Some of this is her baseline of snarkiness. I mean, it's just how she's wired, I think. But she is in the middle of a rambling, to your point, I mean, there are not many questions and answers that are quite this messy, but she's rambling and running off into the quicksand and he rescues her. You see that when she said, we, uh, she has a word pattern. Think about this every day. She, yeah, she has a word pattern shift that says, we have been, and she's not said that up to now, any weird word pattern like that, not just noncommittal, not just rambling, but it's a weird word pattern for her. Remember, she was a beauty queen. She was a pageant person. 
and presentation is everything to your point earlier. Even if you don't answer a question, you probably have a long rhythmic process to it. So I would say, what are you, what are you talking about here? And I would probably be a little snarky back and push her a little bit and be critical. And I'd get what she's got, I guarantee you. She would go at me to tell me how dumb I am and go from there. So uh, Scott, what do you got? All right, here we see the largest illustrators in the whole thing. And when she says, as she's going along, she illustrates almost every word she's saying. And um, it's like she's answering to a child for the fifth time, answering a question, and she's not going to answer it anymore. This is what people do when, they, when they're done, when they're finished with it. They're telling you they're finished with it. They say, I'm not, you know. But the interesting thing here is, and I just caught this, was that big head dip when she says, um, there are, we have no previous knowledge. Uh, uh, of this, but we, when she says we, her head goes, it dips almost like she's bowing to the, to this interviewer. That lets me know she's done at this point. She, it's, it's saying we're, this is the last you're getting about this right now because her head goes low on the, on that part of it. And then she starts again, back in what she just set up with all this data. That means, you know, absolutely nothing when you sit down and try to write it out. But when you listen to it, it just go. it's just like, Huffing and puffing is all that is as you go along. There's nothing really there. It's there, but there's nothing there. It's just all smoke and mirrors at that point. Um, yeah, but she's she's making sure she gets her point across. She's done with that with that question. So, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so as the camera pans to her, you get the lip groom. So she really knows that the camera is moving on her. Again, perception is really, really important condescending, lecturing tone almost to a child. And that's what's eminently unlikable about her. I want you to take a look at some of uh, Margaret Thatcher's interviews because this is the most like Thatcher that she is. You see the nodding of the head and then the shaking of the head at the same time, this, this condescending, downward, low voice that is almost male in its way of pushing you down and telling you exactly how the world is. It's not very likable, is it? And Thatcher was never very likable, and, and neither is, is, is this lady here. So, uh, so it has that cold kind of iron lady perception to it. Again, we've got to be careful how that influences our ideas about her. I mean, one of the things you probably want to do if you're in this kind of situation is be eminently likable so the public will be on your side. And there's no way that the public is going to be on her side. Again, because she doesn't have that sense of loss around her either. So, um, so bad public perception from somebody who is all about public perception. And I hope you liked my, uh, my Thatcher uh, impression there. Loved it. What about that, Mrs. Ramsey? Mm -hmm. um, what about your child's been killed brutally, and then someone writes out this ransom note. Why do you think that that's not feasible? Why do you think it was written before? Because I have been told by people who are experienced in this field that that is usually the way it happens. I have no previous knowledge about these kind of things, but we have been you know, in conversation and in... in uh, we think about this every day. Every day. And we've sought out, you know, the top people in the field that know about how the criminal mind works. And this is what we're, we're going on. The profile that's in the book, you know, all of that information is not from John and from me. This is from, from people that know what they're doing. Okay, we good? Yeah. All right. How is it that you are able to sit here and talk about the body and your daughter? I have to kind of put it in a, in a clinical perspective rather than emotionally when I can to talk about it like this. You know, we have a strong faith. And, you know. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this one, the speech pattern shifts. She's almost childlike in her recall of what she should say. Now, here's the thing, guys. I'm also going to go with you, Mark. If one of us were being questioned, we're in trouble. 
because we would not be likable because we would be informing and telling you how things are. And it's just in the way we're wired. She shifts here. And when they ask her now, if you ask me about bodies and that kind of thing in, in my past life or chase, well, we probably have a little more experience in that world than is normal. But when it's your own child, I, I would tell you that seeing somebody else's body that I don't know probably wouldn't affect me nearly as much as someone I love. I've seen quite a few bodies in my life. And when you lose someone in your family, that is a devastating thing. This is awfully clinical to talk about it, but it's also childlike. So this is probably one of the few places where I start to say, well, there's a soft side of her and she's trying to say whatever. And then she goes up and she, her accessing changes. She's not focused on you and making eye contact and trying to hypnotize you. She is doing something else. She's recalling and thinking and she's avoiding eye contact, which is actually more endearing of her than anything she's done. And now if she had looked at you and said, well, I just compartmentalize it. You would think, yeah, this woman needs to go somewhere. So there's that. Chase, what do you got? I think uh, they, they publicly announce that they're doing all this from a clinical perspective, which I think is, is them saying, this is why you're not seeing emotion. This is why you're not seeing our grief. That's the way that they can explain this. And some people might say, well, they, you know, we're not seeing a lot of grief here because they're numb after this experience. It's, it's an experience. You know, we, we watched the McCanns, for example, and they were really numb. And we'll get back to that in a second. But when she does this, she's gesturing off to her right side when she's talking about something horrible, like something horrible that she needs to get out. She's gesturing to her right side. And this is important. Later, if I was interrogating or interviewing her, when I want her to be emotional, I'll move to that other side, the opposite from where she was associating this clinical part. And I'm also going to gesture with that hand to make her look over that direction, to make her use eye accessing in that direction. And when people say, oh, maybe they're numb, and that's the reason, they just don't show any emotion. There's a ton of emotion here. It's fear, social approval seeking, anger, and disagreement. We see a lot of it here. And people who are spent or empty on uh, emotions are just numb after an experience like this. They're numb from all emotions, not just one. And I think this is an attempt to explain the lack of feeling about the issue. But when emotions are there, you're not numb to the experience. Mark? Yeah, so I totally agree. And I and I buy in from this video to her idea of compartmentalization. She's very clear about uh, where she's where she's placed it. And she seems to be clear to me about where the feelings are and that she's not accessing those now. She's put it in a little package uh, over here and her eyes go all around the house to get from one to another. So I think she she really is experiencing and truly has packaged up the, the, the story and the emotions in different places. Um, but the important thing is, is it comes across very, very cold. And again, from a perception point of view, it doesn't work well for us. So she comes across as cold. That easily makes us feel like she is calculating and then in human and at that point we've dehumanized her at that point you know we can turn her into doing horrific crimes i don't know whether she did or not but all i'm saying is because of her behavior right now it's easy for us to dehumanize her and make her the bad person she could well be maybe she isn't but it's easy for us to put her there so we've got to be careful about about that uh scott what do you got all right. I don't think she's thought about compartmentalizing anything up to this point. However, she has compartmentalized, like you said, Mark, everything, every because it's it's this is years later, and she's been able to put everything in a box. I'm going to talk about this. This is what I talk about. I'm going to talk about this, and this is what I talk. About. So when you get called to do a gig somewhere, you, all, all of us, you go do a keynote. What is what is it for? Oh, it's for the military. Okay, I know the things. I'm going to go deep. Here are the things I always cover on the deep stuff. Then I want to go talk to. A dental assistance and then you, it goes small a lot of the same stuff but you just don't go as deep on anything because you, you know legally we can't but you don't go as deep on anything so uh, she's compartmentalized all this stuff and that's where she's got hers over here she's compartmentalized what she thinks about her over here so as a as a as a whole everything's got its own spot and that's all she's talking about because i think this whole thing has been compartmentalized for her she keeps it in a box and then she brings it up and then she starts looking at the different separate parts of it mentally that's that's what i'm getting from that 
in five years is a long time. You you yeah. can do a lot of compartmentalization in five years. Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say this. The rule of thumb to go off of in compartmentalization, the more a person feels like what they did that they need to compartmentalize or what they witnessed was a result of doing something good or doing the right thing, the easier it is to branch off and scoot somewhere else. Well, that, it's, it's the reason soldiers can box things in a lot easier than the other guys, right? Yeah. 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 We've, and we've all seen, seen and been um, witness to a lot of horrible stuff in, in our gigs. And, and, when, and you have to have a place to do that because if you don't, you know, when you come home, it'll eat you up. You know, it'll start getting everywhere. So I, I think everybody compartmentalizes. And I think this is just observing somebody explaining what that is for maybe the first time, possibly. How is it that you are able to sit here and talk about the body and your daughter? I have to kind of put it in a, in a clinical perspective rather than emotionally when I can to talk about it like this. You know, we have a strong faith. And, you know. So, all right, we good? Yeah. This book, <clears throat> The Death of Innocence, your picture's on the cover. Why your picture and not your daughter's on the cover? This is our story. I mean, there have been, I think this is now the 10th book, I'm understanding, that has been written about this case. You know, we are the only ones that know what has happened to us since Jean Bonnet's death. No one else. This is a story only we can tell. You know, I was even a bit uncomfortable putting her picture on the back. All right, Chase, what do you got? Why would it be a story and not an ordeal, an experience, a trauma, our suffering, our history, our family? It's a story. I think that's an interesting choice of words there. And this offering of uh, discomfort means nothing in terms of the question of true events. When he's talking about, I was actually uncomfortable to put this photo on the cover. And I think it's incredible to hear that it's, it's our story, not her story. It's ours. And I just think that's an unusual choice of words. Maybe she's looping in John Bonet with the word ours. I won't claim to know that, but I will claim to know that she did not credit her daughter in the story at all directly. Scott? I agree completely. I think she's, she's, it's John Bonet's story. So that's what you'd be telling what happened. But maybe she's leaning toward the, the section of here's what we went through for her story, you know? So maybe that's what she's talking about. It's our story or whatever. But I think maybe she separated the child from this whole thing. I mean, it's all about the child, but she's not telling the story, like you, like you just said, Chase, of talking about the, the child at all. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this to me is her baseline. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's about us. You need to listen. This is our story. This is about us. Other people shouldn't be writing our story is what I'm hearing. So yeah, this is not makes her not likable. And Mark, I don't think we can say enough times. Doesn't mean she killed anybody. I do think when you are forthcoming, there's not a lot of smoke and mirrors and stuff about your kid dying. You know, if you talk about somebody, whether murdered or some, something else, you'll get to clear, easy points. If I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened five years ago and lo losing a child, I'm going to be very clear about what happened. I don't need to make it a big deal and a song and dance and about me. It's going to be about what happened and where it's gone. Look, these are all well-known facts, and it makes you feel like someone is hiding something. In my world, when somebody looks like they're hiding something, it's usually guilty knowledge. That's... And we'll always say, you can't tell what happened, but you can certainly say, we need to lift the covers on this one. Something's up. And that's what I see. Mark, you want to bring it home? Yeah. So, so why does this make the public feel really bad? And I think the interviewer hits the nail on the head here. People don't understand how you are past the loss of this. That's the big problem with this. We as a public go, I, I wouldn't have let her go 
uh, so quickly. I'd still be in loss and mourning. Why? Because she wasn't ours in the first place, but we've made her ours. Uh, she became a, uh, Jean Benet became really an icon of the death of innocence, a beauty that gets taken away for no apparent reason. She is almost an urban le legend. She is mythology. And so the parent, I think, at this point is going, uh, you can't have that. This is now my story. I'm going to take control of that. And we don't like that because we don't want her dead. We don't want that child dead. We want to keep that child alive. And the parent here is really killing that child for us and going, she's not even on the cover. We don't even want her on the back. This is our story now. So we don't see the value, I think, of, of that manoeuvre that the parents are, are doing. We, we may have our arguments for why it, it isn't valuable, but we've got to see from their point of view why it may be valuable to them. Again, I don't know who's culpable, who's who's guilty of, of anything here. All I know is that in this interview, she is wholly unlikable. And I think we've got some of the reasons why we don't like her. And we've got to be really careful that, uh, that we understand that that's going to bias us in our judgments and the stories we make up about her. There, I'll leave it at that. This book, <clears throat> The Death of Innocence, your picture's on the cover. Why your picture and not your daughter's on the cover? This is our story. I mean, there have been, I think this is now the 10th book, I'm understanding, that has been written about this case. You know, we are the only ones that know what has happened to us since Jean Benet's death. No one else. This is a story only we can tell. You know, I was even a bit uncomfortable putting her picture on the back. All right, let's throw it around the room and let's come up with uh, two words for what you think is going on here. Greg? Jury's out. What about you, Chase? Uh, guilty knowledge. Mark? Guilty of bad public perception. I know it's not two words, but I don't do two words. <laughs> All right. Then I, mine would be, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'd say. I, I don't know what I'd say. I don't have two words for it. I talk too much. So let's ask John. John, who do you think murdered your daughter? Why was your daughter murdered? Well, I don't know. Um, I subscribe to uh, John Douglas's, and John Douglas was an FBI person who started their profiling program years ago, uh, PhD in psychology, or uh, interviewed over 5,000 bad guys to uh, develop this profiling skill. And he said, this is difficult for me to accept. He said, someone, this was not about your daughter, Jean Bonnet. This was about you. Somebody who's either very angry at you or very jealous of you. And I said, I can't imagine I made anybody that angry. I just, it's not my nature. He said, well, you may not even know him. And um, that was somewhat comforting, but we were... Our company was in Boulder, Colorado, which is a, not a big town. And, um, you know, we were kind of a big fish in a small pond, I guess. And um, that, I think, unfortunately, I think he's right. And um, that's a difficult for me to accept or swallow. But and now I know Lou Smith, who's one of the real seasoned detectives that brought in by the DA on this uh, said, no, it's it. He thought it was a kidnapping going wrong. If you don't know who we are, we're the behavior panel. And I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I trained law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online course, bodylanguagetactics.com with Greg Hartley. Mark. I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. Help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military and wrote the number one best-selling book in behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. And I teach those things in my courses today. Greg. 
Greg Hartley, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, and put together the number one body language online course, bodylanguagetactics.com with Scott Rouse, and I spend most of my time on corporate America. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, um, okay, so first of all, uh, interesting interview, new to me. Um, I don't like the way the interviewer collides two questions together. She actually gets some good answers. But just as a general rule, if you're asking questions, try not to collide two together because it means you can't pass out which one's being answered in what kind of way. So, uh, you know, when you're trying to when especially when you've got a high value interview like the one uh, in front of this crowd incredibly high value interview you can get excited you you can let it get out of control just hold back one question at a time however uh very relaxed there from the subject in what is a high stress situation i expect big hall there we can hear the reverb big hall probably there for a big crowd uh, a crowd that uh, from my understanding would be a, a true crime crowd so they will have some strong judgments about the character that they have in front of them uh right now but he's very relaxed in this large hall situation with a very difficult what should be a very difficult subject for him here his illustrators are good they're they're on point they they match what he's saying and the rhythm is is good that that suggests not under stress uh around this subject or very little stress around this this subject a lot of congruence there which can um suggest a lot of honesty uh, around what he's saying uh, very few looks for approval uh only really one which is didn't uh, I don't think I made anyone angry and there's a look to the interviewer there for I think some kind of uh, approval on that so look there, there may be some ideas in his mind around uh, how he performed as a CEO and and his perception of how he came across and other people's perceptions of how he came across there may be some differences there very reflective in his answers uh, you know thinking about his own experience thinking about his own view of himself uh, people don't tend to do that under the stress and pressure of, of lying, in my experience. There's that sense of resignation as well. It's quite depressed, the tone. It's quite resigned, the tone. And he says, well, I don't know. That's fairly firm. I don't know. So first off the bat there, seems very congruent, very relaxed, uh, very honest what's being said there but i'm open i'm open to being persuaded into uh some other viewpoint on this uh chase what do you got for me yeah one thing we're seeing here for sure in this video is probably baseline behavior and one of these baselines we're seeing is counting on fingers and this is something that we can watch for in the future in response to other questions and i personally have a hard time believing this is any behavior profiler's opinion if currently uh with the evidence that was there uh this might be one of the worst criminal profiles but it i don't think maybe he misunderstood it or misinterpreted it uh, i don't think there's any possible way a profiler would come to this conclusion uh if so it's flawed uh to say the very least and i think it had to have been misheard in some way the, there's a standard profile for this uh, based on FBI statistics, criminal profiling. This person is more likely to be a Caucasian male between 28 and 40, socially isolated, very few friends, uh, obsession with martial arts and weapons. This is a brand new thing that's come out, well, brand new in the last eight years. And social behavior is probably passive, need to be in control of other people, nonconformist, probably has long hair, probably knew the family in passing has a high chance of uh, having an older sister, didn't play sports, high chance there's at least one online record of him visiting sites that exploit children. That's the current profile. Has nothing to do with being angry. This is probably a sexually driven crime uh, just from looking at the evidence. And I know very little about the case, so I'm not a case expert. If you know more, educate me uh, down there in the comments. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, first of all, guys, there's no way we can know more than all of the internet sleuths here. Because you guys who spend a tremendous amount of time on this are going to tell us we don't know the facts. And you're right. 
It's the reason we look at body language. I think, Chase, you said in the beginning, we're not the forensics panel. <clears throat> we are the behavior panel. A couple of things, Mark, you hit dead on. I'm going to use interrogator speak for what you said. Don't ask compound questions. Do you want to go to the store or to the to the CNN building? That's a compound question. The person can answer it any one of many ways, and you don't know what they're answering. So ask clear, concise questions. Rule one. He's got a halting speech pattern here that people may say, well, he's stopping to the, he has had this throughout the entire thing. We'll see him in a few minutes from 2000. He has a halting speech pattern. He also does a data insert and you'll hear him say John Douglas. And then he goes on to qualify who John Douglas is and moves his hands. Congruent messaging when he does his body language moves <coughs> that remember the organism does what made the organism successful. Business people are accustomed to not being able to introduce a new variable without qualifying it. If you're a CEO and you go out to the street and you start introducing while variable X, you create all kinds of chaos. And this guy was a business guy, so there you go. Um, his illustrators are tied tightly to that qualifying his resource. And then his, Mark, I use the same word, congruent whole body messaging at you may, know, may not know the person, that, that whole mindset. Then he does that characteristic, and we're going to see this over and over and over from him this tongue jut. That's just part of his baseline, how he does. And then he does do a disappointment or disdain movement, that withdrawal of his lips. And I think maybe he is right. This is a good start. He looks believable, trustworthy, all of those things. Scott, what do you got? I agree with all you guys up to this point. Uh, his body language and movements are very fluid, little or no stress. His voice, cadence, and volume and tone are all relatively normal to what we've seen and heard before. No in stress indicators other than the slight squeezing of his hands. His vernacular is commensurate with what we've heard before as well. His illustrators are on point, like um, all you guys were saying. They're very fluid, and uh, they land where they should on the words he's emphasizing, like I just did just then, words he's emphasizing. And uh, he's told this story a thousand times, and he's almost loping. He's so comfortable with telling such a horrific uh, story. Uh, so I think he's used to telling it. So let's ask John. John, who do you think murdered your daughter? Why was your daughter murdered? Well, I don't know. Um, I subscribe to uh, John Douglas's, and John Douglas was an FBI person who started their profiling program years ago, uh, PhD in psychology, or uh, interviewed over 5,000 bad guys to uh, develop this profiling skill. And he said, <laughs> this is difficult for me to accept, he said, someone this was not about your daughter, John Bonet. This was about you. Somebody was either very angry at you or very jealous of you. And I said, I can't imagine I made anybody that angry. I just, it's not my nature. He said, well, you may not even know him. And um, that was somewhat comforting. But we were, our company was in Boulder, Colorado, which is a, not a big town. And... Um, you know, we were kind of a big fish in a small pond, I guess. And um, that, I think, unfortunately, I think he's right. And um, that's difficult for me to accept or swallow. But now I know Lou Smith, who's one of the de real seasoned detectives who was brought in by the DA on this, uh, said, no, it's, it, he thought it was a kidnapping gone wrong. John, it, we... I need to ask the question for all these people here. They need to hear your voice. Did you murder your daughter? No. Did Patsy? No. Did Burke? No, that's no. Why should we believe you? Well, <clears throat> um, based, based on what the media reported, I don't know how you could believe otherwise. And we used to get letters from people that say, oh, you know, I, for years I thought you were the murderers of, murderers of your daughter, and I'm so sorry I felt that way. And I'd write him back and say, that's okay. How could you have believed otherwise based on what you were being told? Uh, you know, the media was vicious to us. The police were vicious. People were wonderful to us. Uh, you know, I was asked early on, how is it to be out in public? And I said, it's wonderful. People stop us, give us hugs, apologize for what's being said about us. I said, it really gave me an a understanding or an appreciation of my fellow man that they care about 
other people. And it, it changed me personally. You know, I was pretty much a, I don't know, just insensitive, I guess, to the fact that most people carry a heavy burden. Mm -hmm. And life's not easy. And uh, I was just so touched by the people that would stop. And that even happened today. Uh, and it, this was a blessing. Uh, people stop us and, and pray for us. And, you know, um, at this meeting. And um, so people were wonderful to us. But, of course, the media was vicious. It was a, it was a uh, made-for-TV entertainment. And it was a billion-dollar industry for the media. Um, the John Bonet Inc. It was called uh, in a in a magazine publication. Right. Uh, you know, we came along when the O.J. Simpson trial had ended, and there was this whole bandwidth of media, court TV, all these things that were came up and alive because of the O.J. Simpson trial, and that was over. It's like, hey, what do we do with all this airtime? Well, then we came along and and filled it. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, it's interesting. We always say you should hear an emphatic no when a person is denying something. He does an emphatic no. When he's asked if Patsy did it, he does an emphatic no. And then when he's asked if Burke did it, he says no, and he trails off and starts to say something. And she steps on him, and we don't know what he would have said. Whatever that was, I would have gone back and cleaned that up and said, what exactly were you talking about right here? Just give him a chance to talk. But it's, unnat it's natural for a person to step over that and let the person go, especially when it's a situation where you're talking about their closest loved ones. This guy's lost two daughters, I believe, and a wife. So, uh, and, and I think he had lost a daughter in an accident before. But he's doing sacred space, what I call sacred space. He's barriering and adapting. So he's grinding his hands and making a barrier out of him when he's being asked about his, his family. Once he comes out of that, his whole baseline goes to normal. He starts talking. He does do one thing that's interesting, is when she starts asking him about the questions, he starts to move off and not actually answer questions about why should we not think it's you, and just starts answering questions about, I don't know how you would not think it's me with all the media has done to us, but then to bring up things about other people. Realize this guy's done this for 20 years, 20 plus years he's been talking about the loss of this kid and about the treatment and how they've been perceived. So. He also is keenly aware he's in front of CrimeCon. And if you say he's not making eye contact, he's looking down at the audience. Uh, if you look at video of all of us at the live event, our eyes are all cast down because we're looking at people. We're standing at a higher level. Same thing here. She's so anxious to get her next question that she's drumming her fingers. It's interesting to watch. But she doesn't want to cut him off, and you can see that. You can see a good baseline from him. I see pretty congruent messaging here. I hear emphatic, emphatic, emphatic with some qualifiers. I wish we could have heard what the qualifiers were. We all have our own opinion. We've reviewed Burke, but I'd love to hear what his is. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so we see more counting on fingers here, and that behavior can be seen here again. There's rising pitch when he makes the denial about himself, and I know some people may jump on that. This does not mean deception because there's not a cluster of behavior. When you hear all of us dogpile onto a behavior, you're hearing us just layer this mountain of behavioral indicators together. Those are clusters. There is a cluster of behavior in an unusual place here, though, is denial about Burke. This was the strongest hesitancy. The only time he repeats himself, the strongest head and eye aversion from the person asking the question, the largest hand movement. And this would be a red flag, not deception necessarily. This just means that there's more for us to ask exactly what Greg was just telling you. This is just another place where there's something that needs to come out because something's there. There's something present there that's different than the other two denials. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. I think there's something else there, but I think what that something else is, is his anger toward all the fingers that have been pointing uh, toward Burke. I think that's, and so he's trying not to go off on a, a tangent there about his thoughts on that, which he probably could have done, like you said, Greg, if she hadn't stepped on him. So that kind of, that got on my nerves a little bit. But I'm under the impression he knows what the questions are going to be, because what else, what other questions are there besides what he's been asked a thousand times? His legs are crossed. Uh, as uses those as a barrier, but I think it's for the question more than for the interviewer. And um, he uses hands again as, 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 as adapters. The first two knows on whether uh, he killed or they killed the child. He, he, his, he did, his wife did, or Burke did. The first two knows are, are 
close, but then it, obviously, as we talked about a second ago, the third one's a little bit different, but it goes from no, 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 like that. It's like, dun, dun, dun. So he's, he's getting more relaxed as he goes along because, but it's very quick. His answer is very fast at the top of that, almost like he was uh, not angry, but he's poking back there just a little bit. Then when she asks, why should we believe you? The throat clearing, I think, is just a little bit of nervousness because it questions his veracity uh, uh, at that point. And he keeps his hands, hands clasped because it's a pretty big deal uh, for these questions to be asked in front of a crowd. So that's understandable that he would look just a bit nervous in that way. And he asks a question at the beginning, and then it goes uh, into people who felt bad about thinking he was guilty. You know, he, t he starts talking about that, how, how bad they felt. And he's trying to, he's giving the impression there are a lot of people that believe him and believe that his family didn't do it, um, which, which is fine. His illustrators are still on point and he uses them again fluently. And this lets us know that he's relaxed, that he's, he's done this before, he's used to it. And I think he's got his stock answers. And depending on where he is, he sort of plays off those, uh, those answers. Uh, adds to it or takes away from it, depending on what you could have a hostile crowd or you could have a really nice one. Apparently, this is a really nice one. It's a crime con, so they're really into hearing what he has to say. So I don't think they're going to give him a lot of, of uh, um, brush or push back on anything. But I'm not seeing any deception uh, so far or any big stress cues. And I think it's it's going smoothly so far. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he knows this question is coming. And so we do see him prepare himself. I think he crosses his legs. He bolts himself down a little bit. I think that's under, understandable. I'm not going to put that down as he he's, he's getting ready for his deception. Also, there are three clear no's, but different intonation on each. I like, Scott, that they, they go down in tonality each time. It's very finalized on that end one. Although you're absolutely right. Um, no, that's... No, I, you know, it, uh, this interviewer, um, uh, you know, one of the things you've got to do if you've got a high value interview is take your own pulse first, you know, look after yourself before you go into that high value interview, because you need to calm down during that. And, and I don't think this interviewer is, 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 is calm enough to really get the best out of this situation because you're right, she should have gone back on that or she should have let him answer fully because we wanna know what is his view on this. He has very different views on why not, why no for each one of those participants there. And that's why I think we get a different intonation of no, some subtle differences there because the reasons why it's not, you know, him or his wife or his son, I think are very, very uh, different in his in his mind. Um, look, for me, what's most interesting about this is that he says, look, media needed something to to fill their their airtime with. We, we all have a little uh, media outlet called the Behaviour Panel. Um, we, there's just been this huge jamboree that's gone on of uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, okay, which has caused many new channels to kind of bubble up because, you know, why not? Of course, why not? And there has been no bigger story since OJ Simpson. This, it's been a, a once in, in every quarter of a, of a century tsunami of, of interest, which means money. People have made a lot of money out of those stories, okay? And what if you'd have started a channel and then suddenly it disappears. Now what do you do? Now what are you going to do for viewers? Because you were part of that tsunami. You were what? You were riding this wave, which was a hundred feet tall, that only happens every quarter of a century. Now what are you going to do with your time? Because you haven't built up that base beforehand. Okay. Now you know we're good. We've been going a long, long time, and we'll just keep doing what we've always done. But if you put on top of that, what if you? bought airspace we don't buy any airspace we, this is all kind of free so this is low cost for us we show up we have a great time and we go home okay you know it's fantastic but what if we'd spent money we would be sitting here right now going man we've got to make our money back here we spent all that money out to the airwaves we've promised advertisers viewers we've got contracts right now what are we going to give them 
we would want a story and that's what he's highlighting here is he's not just you know a dad who's lost a child a family that's lost a child he's part of the media machine which is massive and these stories are are bigger than some of the biggest stories if if there if the benet story was as big as an oj that means it outclassed any of any royal stories if you put a Meghan markle there it would get wiped by it so i just wanted you know Put, put it in that context that what he's saying there about media and the desire, the, the appetite for a big story is absolutely true and people's jobs depend on it. And, and he's as a, as a um, it's, it's very factual, I would suggest what he's saying there. Greg. Yeah, there's one other, one other key point. When you mentioned that his tone is different depending on the person, I know for a fact I didn't do it. I'm sure she didn't do it. There could be, and he could have knowledge and information that would be guilty knowledge if he released it to the public that tells him there's no way that child did it. There's also that. The piece that we don't know is all of that information that's been withheld so that when they get the right person, they know they've got the right person. He may have. He may have that and can't share it. So just remember that when you hear a person talk like that. Yeah, good point. John, we, I need to ask the question. For all these people here, they need to hear your voice. Did you murder your daughter? No. Did Patsy? No. Did Burke? No, that's... no. Why should we believe you? Well, <clears throat> um, based, based on what the media reported, I don't know how you could believe otherwise. And we used to get letters from people that say, oh, you know, I, for years I thought you were the murderers of, murderers of your daughter, and I'm so sorry I felt that way. And I, I'd write them back and say, that's okay. How could you have believed otherwise based on what you were being told? Uh, you know, the media was vicious to us. The police were vicious. People were wonderful to us. Uh, you know, I was asked early on, how is it to be out in public? And I said, it's wonderful. People stop us, give us hugs, apologize for what's being said about us. I said, it really gave me an a understanding or an appreciation of my fellow man that they care about other people and it, it changed me personally you know i was pretty much a i don't know just insensitive i guess to the fact that most people carry a heavy burden mm -hmm. and life's not easy and uh, i was just so touched by the people that would stop and that even happened today uh, and it, this was a blessing uh, people stop us and, and pray for us and you know um, at this meeting and um so people were wonderful to us, but of course the media was vicious. It was a, it was a uh, made for TV entertainment and it was a billion dollar industry for the media. Uh, the John Bonet Inc. it was called uh, in, a, in a magazine publication. Uh, you know, we came along when the O.J. Simpson trial had ended and there was this whole bandwidth of media, court TV, all these things that were, came up and alive because of the O.J. Simpson trial, and that was over. It's like, hey, what do we do with all this airtime? Well, then we came along and, and filled it. And there will be people who watch this and say, as you say that, we want to find the killer. They'll say, well, you are the killer. You know... Look, they, we're never going to convince cynics of, of the truth, so we don't try to. What we're trying to do is solicit help from the public to find this creature and to beg the Colorado officials to be at least objective and open enough to listen when that tip comes through. Then we'll find this person. What's going on with this hatred and obsession and fringe? I don't know. It, it, what we've learned through all this, uh, we've come out of this realizing there are a lot of good people in the world. We've had wonderful people come forward and support us from all the world. And, and, and even though you'd think that we would come out of this being hateful and, and uh, want to go to a, a mountain retreat and fence ourselves off from the world, we realize there are some wonderful, good people in the world. But we also realize that there's some very fundamentally evil, bad people in the world. That's a fact. We were naive about that, but it exists. There are more good people than bad, but the, but the bad exists. And we're never going to change that. And we're not trying to, to convince 
the bad people and the cynics and the hateful people that we loved our daughter and that we didn't kill her. We're trying to appeal to the good people and say, let's find this evil creature that's among us and put him away because this person will kill another child. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a great lesson in microculture. Remember, we talk about cultures being from macro all the way to very large organizations of human beings, all the way down to what I call microcultures. Two people can be a microculture. And signaling and all of that between two people is powerful. She just signaled him, this is yours, please take it. You can't miss it. And let's talk about Will and Jada for just a minute at the Oscars. If you don't think there's signaling going on with a and then hard eye contact, they're signaling too. That's a way we, all of us in relationships, have that capability. We all know how to signal each other. We all know each other's hot buttons. We know that if I don't respond to a certain thing, something's going to happen. It's interesting to watch this signaling and her move over because what you're seeing here is a guy who worked for Lockheed Martin, who's accustomed to being on the hot seat and probably can take it a lot better, and his hot buttons don't rise to the top as quickly as somebody who doesn't have to deal with that. Because if he did, he wouldn't make it to the point he did in business because his buttons would get pushed and he would get walked out the door. So they're, they're taking advantage of their strengths. One of the interesting pieces to me here is he starts to work to, to search for words. If you see him go to his right and search for words to characterize what he wants to say. And I thought to start with that was probably what it was. And we get confirmation when she asks him a conjecture question. What is going on in the world? That forces him to go and create thought. So he goes right back to the same place he's doing when he's trying to answer her initial question. You hear his cadence shift to give him time to think when he says what we're trying to do. Inhales and delivers his words. Dr. Phil has a term that I love called CEOitis. And it's when a person feels like they have to answer a question even without data. And even though you just asked them three minutes ago, and then you come back to the question, they're like, well, I better have the answer now. And they come back and answer it. What he is really good at is he doesn't do it. You can see he's trying to come up with the right answer. But all of that messaging when he's delivering it is congruent. Voice, nods, cadence, raises his brow. But his brow is not a request for approval. It's a, do you understand? more of an illustrator of that's the point. And then you see him do a tongue jut. We know that's just kind of what something he does over and over and over. And it might even be an illustrator in this case for that's all I got to say about that. When he's interested and when she's talking, you see him raising his brow a little, but he's, his lips are pursed. When she's asking that conjecture question, he breaks his eyes, goes and answers, and then goes back down to right to talk about what's going on. All over, around this looks congruent, mimics the same thing we saw before when he's talking about non-threatening people, cadence, illustrators, everything's together. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right, after the question, uh, Patsy looks to him, like you were saying, because they've worked out who's gonna answer what. When that subject comes up, she looks to him and he starts answering the question. And dur during the question when he says hateful, we see a micro expression of contempt, uh, and that's for the people who spoke out against him. And all the lip licking, like we said earlier, that's just part of his baseline. It, it, it means most likely absolutely nothing. It may be an adapter here in a little while, while when he sort of leans on that at the end of some things. But his entire answer, as with all of his answers, are, like you were talking about, uh, Greg, is it's CEO-like. It's like a CEO speaking, and which makes sense. His sentence structure is the same as somebody who's highly educated uh, and has experience with solving problems. And um, he's great at getting to the root of the problem and get and sussing it out and getting to the root of it and explaining what the problem is. There's a guy named Michael Bertram, and he was the CEO at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. And he was really good at that. He could look at something and say, okay, here's the problem, explain it to you very quickly, and then after getting to the root of it, say, here's a problem. Here's how we fix this. Greg, you can do this. You're good at that, even with us. So it's not a problem and saying, hey, uh, here's what the problem is. Here's what we need to do. This is what's been done before. And this is what uh, I think we should do moving forward. And we talk about it. And we do it 99% of the time because it makes sense and it seems like the, the thing to do. And with those kinds of things, you're you're either a person who can do that or you're not. I don't think it's something that's that you can learn to, to be able to see to see the root of problems like in that um, the specificity of a of a problem, the very bottom of a problem. I think that's that's for whatever company you're with. I think that's a gift for your CEO to have that because it's so 
potent and powerful. I think he's good at that. I think he's controlling everything he says and everything he does and putting it in that his past experience of being a CEO and treating this like he's dealing with a problem uh, with a company. So I think from that that point of view, I think it's, it's really uh, it's really cool to see him doing that. I think it's that, that's kind of cool. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so first off, it really is the same person as we saw in the first two videos, just with a more, an even more intense situation here. It's it's closer in time to the the um, the loss of the daughter, and uh, though I think there may be some months or years between them. Again, I'm not an expert on this case, like many people may be out there, but look totally there's no change in character between who we saw in the first videos and 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 this person here uh the word creature we see distaste that sense of you know a nasty taste around sour taste here in uh, around creature um th um then we'll find the person there's anger there uh we get tightening of the lips and i think we get uh, a, a, a tongue jut or a grooming there, which might be out of his that baseline that we're seeing all the time, where he's maybe grooming the anger away. He doesn't seem like a person that wants to overtly display his anger around this situation. He may want to give the impression that he's very much in control of his his emotions. Um, big stress on beg will beg the Colorado officials. Well, I think there's some stress there because why, why would you ever have to beg any officials to do their job, which is to investigate where things should be investigating? So, you know, you could say, hey, you know, he's trying to lay up some, some chaff and redirect over there. Doesn't really seem like that, though. Uh, we'd want a lot more attention over, over there. Uh, I think it's just a little lay down there of of we are we are truly subservient to you and we beg you to to reinitiate this investigation you know because we're hoping that if we keep on putting this story out there new information will come in and you will investigate this instead of putting all the pressure on investigating uh us um lots of other parts of anger i think in there certainly yes you're right uh scott contempt and disdain on hateful anger on naive about that um uh and the and the bad exists um let's find this evil creature that's among uh, among us let's find this evil creature that's among us so chase to your point often there's no vanishing perpetrator here they know the perpetrator the perpetrator i mean they know they have not they have a a description in their mind of that perpetrator creature a distasteful creature uh, an evil creature that's among us again that's not something i would expect uh to hear from people being or someone being deceptive in past what we've heard a lot of is well i just don't know just don't know what the person's going to be like just you know who knows who knows they know they know they've got a, a character they've got some characteristics in mind for this uh chase what do you got on this one yeah i agree with you guys and i think mark to your begging point uh, I think they will, they are having to beg at that point. I think d throughout the trial until today, they're dealing with a stunning degree of incompetence slash negligence, uh, on, on that side of the, the fence. But in this video, uh, we see another baseline behavior of defaulting to answering questions by socializing the answer and redirecting the topic to social support. So that was not the question at the first video that we looked at where we saw this. That wasn't necessarily the question in this video, but the answer gets redirected to social support. And we're seeing good baseline. This is a decade or more apart. I think two decades apart. Uh, there's comfort using two key words in this clip, kill and creature, neither of which would be more likely in a deception. So we're seeing truthful here. 
answers are focused directly on perpetrator, not the story, and directly focusing on getting help and law enforcement involvement when not specifically asked about it. It's not like I'm a reporter saying, hey, would you like the police to get involved? And the parents are going, yes, that sounds like a great idea. He's he's forcefully pushing it into the conversation, which is a big deal. Blink rate is steady. No pupil dilation or constriction. He failed to use his daughter's name. We say that every once in a while, but we say it inside of a mountain of other clusters. So if I have a scale here and I put the failure to use the daughter's name here and all the other behaviors on this, that wins. So this whole uh, clip communicates innocence. And there will be people who watch this and say, as you say that, we want to find the killer. They'll say, well, you are the killer. You know. Look, they, we're never going to convince cynics of, of the truth. So we don't try to. What we're trying to do is solicit help from the public to find this creature and to beg the Colorado officials to be at least objective and open enough to listen when that tip comes through. Then we'll find this person. What's going on with this hatred and obsession and fringe? I don't know. It, 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 what we've learned through all this, uh, we've come out of this realizing there are a lot of good people in the world. We've had wonderful people come forward and support us from all the world. And, and, and even though you'd think that we would come out of this being hateful and, and uh, want to go to a, a mountain retreat and fence ourselves off from the world, we realize there are some wonderful, good people in the world. But we also realize that there's some very fundamentally evil, bad people in the world. That's a fact. We were naive about that, but it exists. There are more good people than bad, but the, but the bad exists. And we're never going to change that. And we're not trying to, to convince the bad people and the cynics and the hateful people that we loved our daughter and that we didn't kill her. We're trying to appeal to the good people and say, let's find this evil creature that's among us and put him away, because this person will kill another child. Mr. Ramsey, the police officers told you, or the police officer, the police detective told you to search the house. Tell us about that, please. I don't remember exactly when it was that morning, but uh, we were standing in the uh, foyer of the house and, and Linda Arndt asked me to take someone with me and go through the house thoroughly, look for anything that was out of the ordinary. Uh, Fleet was standing there, my friend, and we both went to the basement uh, and uh, first went into the, what we call the train room, which is where we found the open window and the uh, suitcase up against the wall. Um, we looked there for glass, uh, again, to see if we could find any, any glass, because the window was not only open, it was broken. Um, then I went to the, uh, to the room where we did uh, find John Bonet. Uh, the door was latched. I unlatched and pulled it open and <clears throat> instantly what I found. <clears throat> Tell us about that, please. Well, it was a, uh, a rush of relief, but also fear because her eyes were closed. Uh, I immediately took the tape off of her mouth, tried to untie the her, her arms were bound above her head. I tried to untie the, the knot, and I couldn't get it untied. Uh, her, her skin was cool to the touch, and uh, I picked her up, and, I, and that's when I screamed, and I was, um, I guess, just realizing that things were not going to be okay after all. And things never have been since. No, oh, yeah, they never will be. We've lost our child. It's never going to be the same. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think there's a strong deviation from baseline here at a very particular point about finding her in the second half of this clip. 
The eye accessing goes way off baseline to three o'clock. To as you're looking at it, it's your three o'clock. At this unusual moment, he says, "Went to the basement right at that part," and this a massive detail spike, way out of baseline on evidence and data and insignificant details. And all of these details revolve around proving that a crime occurred, that some uh, kidnapping attempt occurred. And he's maintaining eye contact after an emotional revelation. A revelation. This is largely out of his baseline, big time. And also a red flag for a lot of interviews. If there's an emotional revelation, you don't stare at the interviewer unless you're looking for, did they believe it? So this shows that there's a potential that for a desire to check if it was accepted by the other party. When he says the window was broken, there's lip licking, there's a postural bump, there's a detail spike, there's eye blocking behavior, uh, like a blink flutter here. It's the longest pause that he makes ever. So huge deviations from baseline. There's a sour pucker on his face. As Mark would say, it's a bitter, it's a bitter taste. It's another huge detail spike on describing the latch. And then he says the room where we did find John Bonet, not the room where we found her. It's the room where we did find her. So this is a strong deviation from his baseline, a shift to clinical language, shifting over to clinical language that sounds like an instruction manual. And a lot of us do this unconsciously when we're being deceptive. And it's more congruent speech. So our brain defaults to this congruent speech that sounds more believable and more factual. This is the exact same reason that people are less likely to use pronouns. If you go down to your utility room right now, flip open the manual for your uh, clothes washing machine, it's not gonna have a pronoun in it when it tells you how to do things, no pronouns. So that's a lot of what we're Seeing here is an overall lack of scene, space, sensory details in most of the language here. And the details are adding contain no emotion, which is fine. That's maybe a baseline for him. But all the detail, the spike in detail is focused on having found her at a particular time. Focused on having found her at a very particular time. And I think that's important to note here. This overall suggests a, a, at least a strong discrepancy with timeline and when she was actually discovered according to me anyway in my opinion uh greg what do you got i on the other hand see a hell of a lot of emotion here contained but a hell of a lot of emotion i see hard eye contact when she's doing data intake she's he's doing this hard eye contact what are you asking then he goes to emotional eye accessing down hard right as quickly as he starts talking about facts his cadence slows, we associate slowing of cadence with emotion. His voice softens, we associate that with emotion. His illustrator, his head, his hands, his mouth all seem to be doing the same thing. While I agree, his does make a minor, it, it's pertinent because of when it happens, but a minor eye accessing deviation. Remember that when we go back to memory for eye accessing, it can mean a lot of things. It can mean, hey, where's the it, there can be a red line that I'm not supposed to cross that somebody told me, do not divulge this piece of information. And if I'm remembering an auditory cue, I'm going to go there to find out hey, what was it that, that Chase told me. So I would be careful with that one is my only one I would be concerned with. But there's a lip compression at mm and a cadence shift. That one I, I, is a flag for me to go and say, is that around did I miss her when I looked the first time? Is that around something else? I don't know. I can't tell you that. But I see lip compression and an mm and a cadence shift after all of that fluid congruent messaging so then he goes um again i think that's an emotional issue as a reason he's doing this um and stretching it out if you want to really see how he feels freeze this video and we will at one minute and five seconds and see his face his brows are tight there's disdain withdrawn lips a lip compression eye blocking and deep swallow all of that stuff at what i found makes it look like a very emotional recall that's tough for a person. Now, does that mean he had nothing to do? No, but what it does mean is when he sees her body, I think that at 105, go see that, and that's appropriate body language for that. And after that's when I screamed, you see disdain, and all those arrows are aligned. This is a guy who's accustomed, I'll always say this, if you never dealt, if you never worked in corporate America, and you never worked at the level of a leader of a company, I don't know how big this one is, 
then you get used to being able to get take punches in the face and stomps on your feet. It's what they do for a living. I mean, they have to deal with day in, day out adversity. Don't know this question, but I've worked alongside CEOs who have to go tell somebody their their son, their wife, their husband has been killed at work. You've got to get pretty tough at certain things. So I think depending on where he's been, maybe some of this comes from it. The only place I have a, had a question was around that um and that lip compression and the cadence shift. But then he does it again as he's getting into that face. So Chase, I see your red flags. I think he's still telling the truth, but you know, this is, we can't read minds. This is what makes this great is we're pointing out what we do see. Mark, what do you see? Yeah, let me see if I can add anything here. I, I see um, uh, facial gesture of disgust around the basement. Uh, and, uh, but that seems congruent to me. If there's a, it's gonna see something horrible. There's a horrible act happened down there whether he's something to do with it or maybe isn't something to do with it. Uh, disgust seems more fitting, I think, for if he's not had anything to do with it, potentially. It seems congruent for me. Um, I'm happy with the steady pace that he's going through it, through that story. Um, here's what I'm not happy with, Chase, is... is for me, there's some discrepancies in some details here. Maybe it talks to Greg's point that there are some things that can't be, that need to be kept secret should this investigation go further. But for me, there's, there's, there's some discrepancy around, I think he talks about the window was broken and so they looked for the glass. Well, the glass will be below the window if the person broke in but you won't find the glass potentially, possibly, probably, if they broke out. And so so there's no description of, of why they would find it, why they would need to look for the glass. If somebody's broken in, it's gonna be at your feet right now. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's there's other stuff happens there, but but I don't I don't I don't quite understand that discrepancy there and why that isn't really fully gone into or it seems glossed over a little bit. Um, there's certainly distress, I think, around what he sound. There's a big outbreath of resignation before that description of, of, um, of his daughter. Um, his breathing is depressed. His voice is depressed. That's not usual. In, in my view, around deception, that resignation. Most people, many people that we viewed uh, that are being deceptive, they'll be really up, they'll be really quite energized. They'll be a little more amber heard about the whole thing, a little more up, a little more buoyant to try and prove it. It's done, it's gone, she's gone now. It's, it's, there's nothing he can do about it. It's more despondent, I would say. So I, I get what you're saying that their chase. I'm, I'm. There are and there. There are some discrepancies for me as well. But in terms of out and out deception, which is not what you're saying anyway. But in terms of out of, out and out deception, um, I, I, I'm 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 good. Seems pretty honest to me. But Scott, you got anything? All right. Um, I saw when I was looking at these videos because Greg sends a link in the thing. And there's a video just to the right of one of these. I can't remember which one, but I remember seeing him describe the same thing almost the exact same way. I mean, use this, and because I have the same picture of it in my head as he was explaining it. I'll try, I'll see if I can find it since you guys. Um, but his, his, his voice, tone, and cadence were pretty much the same through that one as, it, as in this one, if I remember correctly. Um, but I think his, his cadence is a little bit slower here other than that. But in this, I, I'm not hearing any fading facts. His volume is solid all the way through, pretty much. And uh, I think his looking away indicates that he's seeing in his mind what he saw that day. And I think um, the reason we're seeing all these things that may look iffy, like he's bounced around a little bit, is because he's thinking of his daughter and finding her body and, and, and going through that as he's talking about it. And his wife's sitting right there. So that's got to be a little unnerving not to make him nervous, but just, you know, keep him on, try to keep him on point. He's trying to focus on what he's saying as he's thinking about the most horrible thing that's ever happened to, to him in his life. Um, but, he, but I think he's in control and he's calm. Not any real um, visible nervousness or heavy nervousness. Just, I think it's just a painful run through of what he saw uh, and when he found the body. But you could be completely right, Chase. This is, you, 
we can't tell and stuff like this, you know? I don't disagree just, that, that it wasn't an emotional finding the body. Yeah. I don't disagree that oh, he's mad no, and disgusted by the yeah. basement. I'm just saying there's a there's this discrepancy to me about timeline and when the body was discovered. Hmm. There's an interesting, if you go to the very last frame of that video, last few frames, you'll see him lost with internal focus in emotion. When we talk about people looking down to their right is one thing, but when they go to their down their right and they get a thousand yard stare, that's lost. That's internal focus. We don't see that very often, and he has it, which is why I think the emotion is real. Now, like you said, yeah. could there be discrepancies in detail? Sure, there still could be a, a ton of things that go on because human emotion is tied up tightly with children, no matter what happens. Mr. Ramsey, the police officers told you, or the police officer, the police detective told you to search the house. Tell us about that, please. I don't remember exactly when it was that morning, but uh, we were standing in the uh, foyer of the house and, and Linda Arndt asked me to take someone with me and go through the house thoroughly, look for anything that was out of the ordinary. Uh, Fleet was standing there, my friend, and we both went to the basement uh, and uh, first went into the, what we call the train room, which is where we found the open window and the uh, suitcase up against the wall. Um, we looked there for glass, uh, again, to see if we could find any, any glass, because the window was not only open, it was broken. Um, then I went to the... Uh, to the room where we did find John Bonet. Uh, the door was latched. I unlatched and pulled it open and <clears throat> instantly what I found. <clears throat> Tell us about that, please. Well, it was a, uh, a rush of relief, but also fear because her eyes were closed. Uh, I immediately took the tape off of her mouth, tried to untie the, her, her arms were bound above her head. I tried to untie the, the knot and I couldn't get it untied. Um, her, her skin was cool to the touch and uh, I picked her up and, I, and that's when I screamed because I was, um, I guess, just realizing that things were not going to be okay after all. And things never have been since. No, oh, yeah, there never will be. We've lost our child. It's never going to be the same. One of the most unusual parts of this has been this Ferris window. You know, I know that you've seen it several times, but would you go over it with us and tell us what you know and what you've been told about it? Well, first of, first of all, uh, this, is, this is what is going to help us convict the killer. This is three pages of handwritten writing samples of the killer. We've been told by experts that if we have a suspect and we get sufficient samples of his writing, they will be able to tell conclusively with this much of a sample that the person wrote that note. So this is a huge clue. Why it was left, I don't know. And let me just interject at this point. Mrs. Ramsey, it's my understanding that the Colorado Bureau of Investigation took your handwriting samples to the Secret Service. Do you know the results of that test, definitively? Mm, no, I don't. I just, no, we had experts do the same kind of testing, and it's my understanding that the people that, that we use trained the people from the CBI, Colorado Bureau, that, that administered the tests. And they, on a scale of one to five, with five being absolutely no match, I ranked at a 4.5, with one being perfect match. So, you know. Now we don't we don't know the results of the police testing. We've we've heard that they're at best inconclusive. Uh, the governor said this morning on national TV that you've seen all the evidence in the case. Oh, I, I, I would be desperate. If, the if, if there is evidence we haven't seen, I would ask the governor to please let us see it. Please let our investigators see it. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, for the most part, this is what I call steering, not clearing. Help me find, help me find, help me find. Clearing is I'm clearing my name. Hey, look, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Except she does say 
that the Secret Service or their handwriting expert gave her a 4.5 out of 5 with discrepancy. So she comes across, and I think this is part of the reason people disliked her so much, is she feels this need to clear. He doesn't. He doesn't do any clearing. And the best, my favorite part of this whole thing is the very beginning. Her dominant eye is shrunk down very small, and she is like, you're about on my last nerve and you can see it's getting really close and he knows that so he just does what he does he's stoic goes on about his business however he's got such a plan for what he wanted to say and this is what happens when you go into a negotiation you come in with something in your mind you want to say and when you hear trip words that sound like what you're saying you immediately think they said what you did and you go after it listen because he comes in with a plan where he wants to say i we need all the available evidence and, 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 and whatever the governor has, we want. And then the lady says, the governor says, you've had all the evidence. Well, we'd like to see all that evidence, whatever there is, he says. He, he's tripwired by it. So he looks like he's not paying attention. I think that's pretty common. I have to teach people in business all the time that when you're going to negotiate, come in with what you have in mind always and stick to your plan. But listen to what they're saying, not what you think they're saying. That's the biggest mistake people make. And often the person you're negotiating with has something else to win other than the financial value of what you're talking about. And you leave money on the table because you're so worried about what you came in thinking about. That's all. I'll leave it at that. Hop off there and say, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So um, many people, maybe some people here with us right now, will talk about this uh, nose rub that goes on. Okay, so uh, often, you know, trawl the internet and you'll find a whole bunch of articles that if somebody touches their nose, they're being deceptive. And uh, that's that's just inaccurate. Um, why might he be touching his nose at this point? So what happens is, is when, when we, we have uh, an emotion, blood can rush to the face. Okay, you'll see it happening right now as I produce pleasure. You'll see these get rosier and this get a little rosier. Okay, and uh, and that can cause an itchy sensation, and so often you know somebody will come to their nose and and rub or rub here to deal with that sensation. I believe he's getting excited around this letter because he says, and it's kind of like a semi punishment question here. Um, you know, what should happen to this person? Well, clearly they should be convicted because he says, this is the letter that will convict them. Okay, so that's that's good news. I think he's saying, he's saying, look, we're gonna get the person, we wanna get the person and we wanna get them convicted. So it's almost towards a, a, a punishment ideal here. Um, and he wants to use this. This is a tool of conviction rather than uh, one that is going to distract into another another uh, area of thought. So to your point, Greg, yeah, he's very clear about where he's going with this. He wants he wants somebody caught and he wants somebody um, convicted. Uh, now, uh, his 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 wife, it's Patsy, isn't it? Patsy, yeah, Patsy, yeah. Uh, which you can go and see a, a, a um, um, uh, an analysis that we've done of her, and I think we all found her. Uh, easily unlikable, <laughs> okay? Easily unlikable. I don't think we thought that she had a lot to do with a murder of a child, uh, if anything at all, but we found her very, very unlikable. And so in the court of public opinion, she's not gonna do well. And here's a classic example, is that basically she pulls rank, she pulls status on this one, and she says, our expert taught their experts. That's the kind of thing, that's the, the rank that, that we're at right now. You don't need to do that. It, you come across as unlikable, uh, potentially that people are gonna shout out narcissist at you. And once they start doing that, they're gonna layer on a whole bunch of other stuff. And, and it's, it's a public opinion nightmare. Um, of course, now he never looks good because he's sitting next to her. Okay, and when you're sitting next to somebody unlikable, yeah, that doesn't make you particularly likable either. So we got to look at our frames uh, around this. But you know, as for this letter piece, um, yeah, it, it all seems congruent. It seems pretty good, and I'm okay with that nose rub. Uh, but I'm happy to be, have my mind changed on that. Scott, what do you think? All right, I I, I agree. I think it might be one of those things where he got a little excited and, and touched his nose. Um, because I think maybe he got fired up at that point. 
But at the same time, he gets quieter when he starts talking about this letter because this is one of the main points that he focuses on or likes to focus on. I was under the impression at the at first that she's the one that wrote this. That's what all the everybody said. Ah, she wrote the letter. She wrote the letter. This you know that proves she wrote the letter. I don't know who she's talking about. Said she the, these guys. It's the uh, people who said she didn't. She said these are the people that trained those people. I don't know those those guys. Uh, if that is true, if she is just a four point five, uh, and which says she didn't do it, you remember I had that theory about um, they thought that Burke did it, and that's why when she, she wrote the letter, and then they found out that uh, Burke didn't do it, then there was this letter in the air, and that kind of messed everything up. But I guess that they're even worth a hoot now that 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 is true that she didn't write the letter. But I I think he's probably right. I think the the police dropped the ball on this. And I think if if they approached it from we know you all are guilty, I think they they just dismissed a bunch of stuff and let us, let a bunch of things go. Um, but he's really serious about this. That's he totally focuses on that. That's what he talks about. This will convict him. And this is important and all those things because this is that letter to him is the key, and he believes that is one of the keys to getting that person out of circulation so he doesn't do that again. Chase, what do you got? All right. We're at a crossroads. So I want you to think, just put, put yourself in their shoes for a minute. If this letter is real, this is a real ransom note. You've been obsessing over this note at the time of this video for, I think, weeks. It's been weeks when this video was filmed, not months, but every day, over and over, spending your entire life obsessing over this document so then when they get handed a copy of this document they do exhibit the behavior of curious people people who have been obsessing over a ransom note they didn't write would not need much of an examination at all they wouldn't need to put on glasses they wouldn't need to sit there and and dig into it as if they'd never seen it before i think i'm not saying they wrote it but I am saying this is a desire to display unfamiliarity, which is also a desire to communicate something to the viewer. So if you think about that, there's also no denial about writing the letter or any anger or anything whatsoever. All it is is a score measurement, not a denial. And I think the lack of denial is the same as if they were also kind of waiting to see the results of the test of the handwriting. Why were they waiting for the results? Why were the results important? If you didn't have anything to do with it, the results wouldn't be important at all. You just, you wouldn't be eagerly waiting the results. So this behavior uh, you're seeing right here is not, in my opinion, the behavior you, you would see. This is unusual at best. This single moment in the case kind of sent chills down my spine a little bit. I'm not saying they committed the murder or wrote the note, but something is way off the charts in this behavior that I'm seeing in this clip in particular, their interest in seeing more of the evidence is 100% compelling, honest, genuine, however. So I think all of that is 100% honest, but something is off about the behavior around this note. I'm sorry to disagree with all three of you, and I'm also not sorry. That's all <laughs> I got. Who makes do it you work? think you are? Who is the thief? I think, and I. I think I have a reason for you a little later on as to why they did it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is it Dave? Let's see. One of the most unusual parts of this has been this ransom note. And I know that you've seen it several times, but would you go over it with us and tell us what you know and what you've been told about it? Well, first of, first of all, uh, this is, this is what is going to help us convict the killer. This is three pages of handwritten writing samples of the killer. We've been told by experts that if we have a suspect and we get sufficient samples of his writing, they will be able to tell conclusively with this much of a sample that the person wrote that note. So this is a huge clue. Why it was left, I don't know. And let me just interject at this point. Mrs. Ramsey, it's my understanding that the Colorado Bureau of Investigation took your handwriting samples 
to the Secret Service. Do you know the results of that test? Definitively? Mm, no, I don't. I just no. We had experts do the same kind of testing, and it's my understanding that the people that, that we use trained the people from the CBI, Colorado Bureau, that they administered the tests. And they, on a scale of one to five, with five being absolutely no match, I ranked at a 4.5, with one being a perfect match. So, you know. Now we don't we don't know the results of the police testing. We've we've heard that they're at best inconclusive. Uh, the governor said this morning on national TV that you've seen all the evidence in the case. Oh, I, I, I would be desperate. If, the if, if there is evidence we haven't seen, I would ask the governor to please let us see it. Please mm -hmm. let our investigators see it. What is it that you want to do with regard to this case? What we are desperate to have happen now. We've gone for three years. Only my family has been investigated. The grand jury refused to indict us. And it takes very little evidence to indict someone. Mm -hmm. All we've done is gotten back to the beginning. But we don't want it to be the end. I'd like for political ambitions to be put aside. I'd like for egos to put us, be put aside. There are no apologies needed, but let's get on with an investigation. Let's get on. Let's staff this investigation mm -hmm. with seasoned, experienced homicide investigators, the best we can find, the best we how, can How do we know that it's just because you don't like the outcome of what Boulder police have decided, that you're under an umbrella of, of suspicion, that you just want another chance? Well, they can investigate us. If, if, if the governor would put together a seasoned investigative team, to start over, go back through all the leads, all the evidence. We'd they be can start fully all over again. Right. And they can investigate us again if they want. That's fine. But please don't just investigate us because if you do, we're never going to find the killer. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, watch him as he's listening. He's moving his mouth. Now, one of two things could be happening. He could be one to step on her and go and tell her what he's thinking, or it could be data intake. Some people, when they're doing that mouth movement, they're digesting information. Animals move their mouth. It's just what we do, mammals specifically. Horses do it when they're learning. They'll do that. Your children, you have to teach them not to do that when they're coloring because that's what mammals do. So it's part of a data intake for us. Again, we get to steering, not clearing. Help us, help us, help us. Not, hey, here's why we're innocent. The most demonstrative thing he said to now, the most emotion we've seen, is they can investigate us. Happy with that. And then the head shake, you'd say that's opposite of his messaging when he says they can investigate us. I think it supports his messaging saying, we didn't do anything. Come get us. This is the first time he shows any anger. And he's showing those lower teeth that we associate with anger and then a lip compression at the very end as he controls emotion. I think they're getting on his nerves there, but he's doing all the right stuff, delivering the message that he needs to deliver to make sure this gets gets out. Scott, what do you got? All right. I'm, shoot, man, mine's so close to yours. I'll try to word it up a little bit differently. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, tongue juts and lip licking and, and mouth maneuvers going on in there. But that's, again, part of his baseline, just like it, we saw now back then. Earlier in the videos we saw, uh, they were more more up to date. But even back then when he's doing this, he's still doing the same stuff today as he was back then. So that's part of his baseline. It's just, just something he does. And we can see and hear the anger and frustration in his voice when he's telling what he wants done and how they can, uh, and putting together a, a new investigative team to check into all this stuff. His indicators let us know he's, he's speaking freely and he's speaking with the, the emotion that makes those illustrators land on point where they should every time. And, he, and while he's talking, he's almost loping along there. He's he's as he's given this out because it's it's heartfelt, I think, at the uh, from what he's talking about. Uh, again, we're seeing the tongue juts in the middle of all this and, and the lip licking. And that's, that's just part of his baseline. I'm not seeing any cues or signs of deception or hearing any either. And I think he's being 100% himself and he's saying what he wants to say with no holds barred. And he's, as he remains the professional uh, that he is, to keep it in that CEO lane of solving problems and tell him what the problem is. But he just notches it up 
a little bit and gets over that emotional thing. And so we see a little bit more emotion in here than we have up to this point as he's being that uh, professional. But again, keep in, in mind, this is the most horrific thing that's ever happened to him. And that's why. So I think all that's OK. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let me see if I can pull this together a little bit with what you're saying and also what we noticed at the start uh, of of this in the first videos, which is why should we believe you you didn't do it was the question asked in that in that uh, um, at that event. And he doesn't answer that question. Why doesn't he answer? Why should we believe you didn't do it? Why do they lean in on this? piece of paper to to display clearly or oh, let's have a really good look at this because this is one of the pieces of evidence that they have a a, a um an analysis of that says from the analysis they did not write it now having said that it's not their job to prove their innocence that's not their job that's not modern detective work or law. No detective should ever go, which they have done on this case, which he, according to him, hey, give us the evidence that you're innocent and we'll shout it out to the streets. That's not the way it works. That's not the way modern detective work or the law for sure works. Well, why doesn't it work like that? So we're gonna get into some, in here, some, some deep, almost pedantic values about the way that justice is meant to work. And they go right back to Johannes Monarchus, 1200s. Uh, he was a French lawyer. I knew you were going to love this. And what he said to Pope Boniface was, because Pope Boniface was like, he was like, he would as much as look at you and go, well, you're obviously guilty. Uh, Pope Boniface, uh, uh, Johannes Monarchus. Um, so he says, he says to the Pope, uh, look, you can't just go calling people guilty uh, just because you like it. You have to presume them innocent. The presumption of innocence. Nobody has to say that they has to prove their innocence. They're already innocent unless you can prove them beyond reasonable doubt that they are guilty. Uh, the Pope said, well, why should I do that? And he said, well, because God did that. When, when God called Adam, uh, in the garden and said, hey, Adam, uh, who ate that apple? He didn't, God didn't go, clearly you. I mean, and that's God. Like, he didn't go, clearly you, you're guilty. He, he actually took him into court and presumed, God presumed Adam innocent until Adam went, yeah, sorry, uh, it was me, I, I ate the apple. Well, actually, she she sold me to, I was copying her. Um, so it's a little more complex, but ultimately he said, because God did it, the Pope should do it, and therefore everybody should do it. I think um, uh, this guy thinks exactly the same. It's a little bit pedantic, okay? It's a little bit pedantic, but he's so annoyed and angry that there is no presumption of innocence for him. And that's why they lean in, because they don't want to prove themselves innocent because it's not their job, but they're having to do that in order to get some kind of real investigation and maybe justice for their daughter. There you go. Hope that was worth it, your time, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Greg, what do you got on that one? Oh, Chase, Chase, come at us. What you got? Yeah. So uh, I sincerely admire John's composure. As, as I understand it, this was one of the most incompetent investigations uh, in a very long time. And this request for help to find the killer, not the alleged kidnapper, the, but the killer, are totally honest and absolutely truthful. There's not a shred of stress or deception that I could see here uh, other than the, the emotional stress of, of having gone through what he did. What is it that you want to do? with regard to this case? What we are desperate to have happen now, we've gone for three years, only my family's been investigated. The grand jury refused to indict us, and it takes very little evidence to indict someone. Mm -hmm. All we've done is gotten back to the beginning, but we don't want it to be the end. I'd like for political ambitions to be put aside, I'd like for egos to put us, be put aside, 
There are no apologies needed, but let's get on with an investigation. Let's get on, let's staff this investigation mm -hmm. with seasoned, experienced homicide investigators, the best we can find, the best we how, can. How do we know that it's just because you don't like the outcome of what Boulder police have decided that you're under an umbrella of, of suspicion, that you just want another chance? Well, they can investigate us. If, if, if the governor would put together a seasoned investigative team to start over, go back through all the leads, all the evidence, we'd they be can start fully all cooperative. Over again. Right. And they can investigate us again if they want. That's fine. But please don't just investigate us because if you do, we're never going to find the killer. What do you think happened in your version of when the intruder broke in, how the intruder broke in, when the intruder broke, wrote the ransom note, and when the intruder uh, kidnapped Jaminé. And do you think that the intruder wanted to actually take her out of the house, was actually going to kidnap her? We've been told by seasoned investigators that this is what it appeared. It is what it appeared. It was, a, it was an attempted kidnapping. Something went very badly wrong. We believe that the killer was in the house when we came home. We believe the note was written before John Money was killed. Whether it was before we got home or after we went to bed, we don't know. Um, we have, I have strong reason to believe that the killer either entered or left the house through the uh, basement window that we found open and we found a hard Samsonite suitcase flush up against the wall as if it were a step to get out of the window. The window was probably five feet off the floor, so they had to step on something to get out. Um, that's my best guess at how at least they got out. They would have need, needed the suitcase to get out of that window. Um, how do you think they were going to get her out of the house, or he? We've been told that uh, the suitcase may have been involved. Uh, Chase, what do you got? There's a Patsy has a very strong chin thrust right at the beginning there, right at the mention of ransom note. And there's a very hard digital flexion at the mention of kidnapper. You can watch it back and maybe it'll be playing right now on your screen. And when the words come out of John, it is what it appeared. There's a this is a detail spike occurring now in a just a really strange place. It is what it appeared. Of of course it's what it appeared to be, or it should be. So all the stress and deception markers are wrapped around this is not 90 percent honest, but where we see little spikes of stress and deception markers, which are just stress markers most of the time, are wrapped around the ransom note, attempted kidnapping with kind of zero stress and deception markers around the murder and a lot of just very straightforwardness around the murder. And all the detail spikes are adding detail to every piece of evidence about the kidnapping and zero detail spikes about the murder. And keep that in mind. They didn't talk about any of the murder weapon, uh, any of the stuff that's publicly available. The murder had zero detail spikes. The kidnapping elements had tons of detail spikes. Super strange to me. Definitely a, a data point worth looking into. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Remember, when we covered Patsy, what we said is there's so much moving, there's so many moving parts here, it's difficult for us to get our head around why they would cover some of this stuff or why they would show spikes. I always try to say, in the benefit of a doubt, when you're dealing with a crime like this, where there's so much hidden stuff, the way the person is going to be convicted is on guilty knowledge. We'll probably never see a conviction in this murder. So I always try to figure, are they trying to hide some guilty knowledge? By, and by that we mean, for example, a red shoelace was used to bind her throat. They, they would never tell us what color shoelace was or any of that kind of thing because they don't want us to know exactly what that was. The person who did it, they'll find out because they'll find that person owned red laces or something like that. So you look through that kind of data they may have to try to cover. Now, there are some interesting, you're right, I mean, there's some odd, too much detail when he's talking about the letter. I think the letter, there's another piece that you have to remember when you lose a child things start to represent that child. 
as creepy as this might sound to you, that letter is the last connection they had to that little girl. Now, what kind of brain that does to your brain, I don't have any idea because I've never been through it, but it may have a place in their brain. I try to give them the benefit of a doubt there. It's interesting because the woman asked a conjecture question, which is good for baselining, but this guy's answered this question many times by now, so you can't get a good baseline because it's repeated. But the way you break cover is by asking a person enough questions that go away from memory to try to get a conjecture answer. She does, he does go to conjecture in his eye movement that we saw earlier, so we know he's following that. She does one of the worst questions I've ever heard. So Chase, what do you want for Christmas? And where do you think it'll be built? And who do you think who do you think is coming over to your to your bachelor party? And that's the question she just asked. Like what the hell is she asking? It goes on and on and on and so multifaceted and so compound you can't really answer. Patsy to me with that chin thrust my, this is my instinct. Now I'm going to say this is instinct. It's only based on a lot of experience with people is she's been taught to actively listen because it's not in her DNA. It's in her DNA to go and go right back at you when you go after something that is her hot button. And she's been taught to actively listen, something he does well. And he said, don't say a word. Somebody has said, don't say a word until they finish the question. You watch him moving his mouth when he does it. And we all know that your partner in your whoever that is in your life knows more about you than you know about you in terms of your behavior with others ask them they'll tell you where you need to where you need to focus he's doing that back to that ceo and data points but he does give more data chase why i don't know I, but there is more data in some places there's also a lip compression at the end of we don't know and he's conjecturing using i mean he's not willing to conjecture and use the data that he does have right in that area around the suitcase and all that I think he's hiding something. I think he's hiding something that's making him uncomfortable to hide it, even though the something he's hiding is probably legitimate and above board and somebody's giving it, giving him information and said, do not share this. I'll give you a great example, the Stephen Pankey thing. Remember we covered that. There was a specific story around that there were, a rake had been used to hide tracks around the back of the house and that was guilty knowledge they hung him on. So just to give you an idea, it could be something that simple. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, only one thing, and just backing up what everybody's said there, really, which is, well, look, blink rate is 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 fairly low there, feels fairly confident. Um, it's a steady story. The details, to me, sound fairly relevant. The only place it moves from the, the baseline of that is around the suitcase, and it slows right down, and there's some gaps there. So, you know, the only relevant thing I have there is something deeper about the suitcase. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about this suitcase, but there's something up with that. I have no idea what it is, but there's a strong deviation from the baseline there. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I, I, I agree with Greg. I think the suitcase is a situation where they said, here's what happened. Don't say this. Don't talk about this. because when he went in there, he was the first one, and he saw a bunch of stuff. And they and and as you know, when they say, "Don't talk about this," because the only person that will know this, other than you and that guy that was with you, is the person who did this. So you want to you just keep that to yourself. So I think maybe he accidentally stepped in something he shouldn't have, and that's why we see that little bit of, of frustration, not frustration, but panic on him. When he gets in that situation, that's the feeling. I, that's what I thought when I saw. I thought, "Whoops, he's letting something out," because he thought about it. Thought about it. He shook his, his head, went forward three times before he said, "Before he said, there's uh, something to do with a suitcase," which obviously means they're going to put her in a suitcase. Maybe there was one laying out that, that they would put her in, and that was the reason for it. And the only person that would know that was the person who was who was doing it. That could be the situation, but I think he accidentally let information out. And that's what we're seeing on him, the feeling bad, and maybe not feeling bad, but going, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. At the same time, being frustrated because he wants to say all that because he's, this same police department has messed things up so badly. That's the frustration I think we're seeing there. I think that's what it is with, with, um, with that statement. And the confirmation nods he's showing during that are just that, they're, they're confirmation nods. And a lot of people be saying, oh, he should be shaking his head no, but he's shaking his head yes, and he's confirming it. He's just confirming what he's what what he's saying and what he believes in at this point. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm not seeing anything deceptive, you guys. Um, just around that suitcase, I know everybody's focused on that, but that's, that's what I think happened. It was an accident. He let out, let out too much, and it was too late to reel it back in. But so he let out 
even though he thinks he didn't let out too much or stopped, it doesn't matter at that point. I, the fo- I mean. All the photos are shared online of that suitcase. But maybe there was another one in that room is what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and my, my point is, something. it doesn't matter. It, it may have nothing to do with a suitcase. It may have something to do with around the suitcase. But, you know, you never know what guilty knowledge is that they're trying to hide. You just don't know. Yeah. It could be yeah. one weird little thing, you know, one weird thing. You just never know. Yeah. I, I, I'm not saying that there's not some anomaly in his behavior. I'm saying that could be a reason. Oh, there is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he, he it, it gets weird. He certainly there for shows an anomaly. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and uh, well, this is one of those good ones where we all got a different point of view. What do you think happened in your version of when the intruder broke in? How the intruder broke in? When the intruder broke wrote the ransom note? And when the intruder uh, kidnapped Jomini, and do you think that the intruder wanted to actually take her out of the house? Was actually going to kidnap her? We've been told by seasoned investigators that this is what it appeared. It is what it appeared. It was a, it was an attempted kidnapping. Something went very badly wrong. We believe that the killer was in the house when we came home. We believe the note was written before. John Money was killed. Whether it was before we got home or after we went to bed, we don't know. Um, we have, I have strong reason to believe that the killer either entered or left the house through the uh, basement window that we found open, and we found a hard Samsonite suitcase flush up against the wall as if it were a step to get out of the window. The window was probably five feet off the floor, so you had to step on something to get out. Um, that's my best guess at how at least they got out. They would have need, needed the suitcase to get out of that window. Um, how do you think they were going to get her out of the house, or he? We've been told that uh, the suitcase may have been involved. Ramsey? The police asked that question of me. They said, hypothetically, if Patsy did it or you thought she did it, would you turn her in? And I had to think about it because I was like, I never even thought about that. Because I, it, 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 and, and, I, and I tried to give them a, a thoughtful answer. And I, I thought, and I said, yes, I would. Absolutely. You turn her in? Yes. Mm-hmm. With, without question. Uh, your, your love for a child is unconditional. Your love for a spouse is conditional, and uh, there's no there's no question. I mean, it's, it's I would do anything to protect my children. Mark, what do you got? Yep, I think there is real surprise there. In I had to think about it, though it's though it's kind of acted out. You know, he's 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 displaying that moment of when they said, "Hey, you know." Uh, uh, would you turn in your wife if she did it? But I think that's that's real surprise. Go back, take a look, see, see if you see those those facial action codings of surprise. I think I do. Um, he's very clear. Uh, you love a ch- your love for a child is unconditional. That that seems unequivocal and 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 very clear from him. The way he says that. The, the non-verbals around that, don't shout out to me, you're the guy who murdered that child in any way whatsoever. I would do anything to protect my children. I think I see more anger there, suppressed. Yeah, so I think I see suppressed anger on, I would do anything to protect my, my, uh, my children. Um, yeah, that's all I got on that one. But again, seems relatively congruent for this situation. Uh, Not deceptive in my mind. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I never saw this clip before until this morning, about 5.15 in the morning. And this single clip shot me out of my chair this morning when I watched it. I think this has the potential to illustrate the case. And let me walk you through my brain here for just a moment. If you'll bear with me, he says your love for a child. So he says, your, 
socializing everything because he wants you to understand his decisions. Love for a child uh, is unconditional. And he does not say my love for Jean Benet or my love for my child or my love for my daughter. Love for a child in general. So one question I repeatedly ask during every interview, especially ones like this, very, very calculatedly, what issue is being covertly socialized? So he's only deviating from baseline, which is talking about himself and Patsy and shifting to using the word you to subconsciously socialize something to you. The video ends with him saying, I would do anything to protect my children, plural. And if I had made a decision to protect a different child and I was fiercely defending that, that might explain the anger that you are just describing there at the end of that clip, Mark. Scott, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one for me because she asked a question and he that shock, that surprise that that you see, Mark, he's remembering when he was first asked the question and he, but he gets awfully animated and he's wow, that's a weird question for me, but he gets really animated, almost like a kid. Like I really never did think of her as doing it until I was asked the question. Then I had to ask myself the hard question. What would I do? And I said, look, and look, he's been divorced. If you've been divorced, you know, love is conditional <clears throat> the spouse. Most of us know that we're not going to cling on to the person we're, that we left behind. So th that's a fairly bold statement. It's also a pretty bold statement with her sitting right there. You know, that's saying something. And I think he purses his lips in this case because he's thinking. I don't think it's a disapproval or any of that kind of thing. I think his Mark, you and I are on the same page. He's animated. We don't typically think of people who are lying being this kind of animated. This is more bubbly. And, you know, look, I never even thought of that. I see all of his arrows lining up. I see him being positive. I don't see him being negative. I don't see him lilting. I don't see him doing any kind of weird body language, anything that would make me think anything otherwise. Chase, to your point, whether he's done something other than above board to protect Chuck, I can't see that from here. But he's clearly making a statement. My child is more important than anyone, including my wife. And he says children, which means all of his children are more important than anyone including his wife. I see congruency. I trust that what he's saying is true when I watch this. Scott, what do you have? Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people that say uh, he shook his head no when he, was, when he should have uh, said yes, when he should have been nodding at yes and vice versa, and but not in this situation because he's sifting through the, the information. He's getting, he's structuring his answer and getting ready to deliver that and is delivering it at the same time while he's structuring it, even though he's told this story a thousand times. Up to this point, I think this might be the first time he said this out loud about um, his loyalty to his uh, who would be the most loyal to his wife or his kids. So I think there might be a little a little uh, question on that, which goes back to the absolutes. You know, just because you do one thing doesn't mean you're lying, telling the truth or anything like that. So I think that's pretty important. But um that's uh, I, I see what you're saying, Chase, about about you're like we talked about earlier, you're getting ready to go down the thing or you did go down the road. It's not just my child. It's my children. So that's how that what you're talking about fits fits in there. What, what we discussed in the break there. So I agree with that. Mr. Ramsey, the police asked that question of me. They said, hypothetically, if Patsy did it or you thought she did it, would you turn her in? And I had to think about it because I was like, I never even thought about that. Because I, it, 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 and, and, I, and I tried to give him a, a thoughtful answer and I, I thought and I said, yes, I would. Absolutely. You turn her in? Yes. Mm -hmm. With, without question. Uh, your, your love for a child is unconditional. Your love for a spouse is conditional. And uh, there's, no, it, there's no question. I mean, it's... it's I would do anything to protect my children. All right. Well, this is the roll around the room and uh, tell what each one of us thinks about what's going on uh, a minute or less. And Mark, you want to go first? If you think that John Ramsey murdered his own child in, or was involved in that 
in any kind of way, I will gamble big money. You are barking up the wrong tree and wasting your time on this one. And we've said that, I've said that about other cases. Uh, if you take me to the casino on that one, I guarantee I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win that casino. Chase, what do you think? I fully agree. Absolutely agree with you. And I'm gonna throw a hypothetical situation in here really quick. I think, in my opinion, there was 100% a legitimate killer that has yet to be identified as we know of. And here's this hypothetical situation. They thought John Bonet's brother, their son, uh, did this to her. Uh, he hit her with a golf club in real life recently before the murder took place. To protect Ramsey, they staged the kidnapping attempt and later realized that he wasn't at fault. And I think all these years have passed, and each passing day made it more difficult to admit that anything was done to protect their son at all costs because they may have thought he had done the act. This is hypothetical, but that one hypothetical situation makes every single anomaly in all of the behaviors, even the one we analyzed with Dr. Phil, all of the anomalies line up if that situation is, is placed. Just my opinion. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Well, you sound like OJ, hypothetically. <laughs> Just so you know. Yeah, no, look, guys, something went on in this house that we can't see. Nobody can see. There's probably some guilty knowledge, some hidden information in there that we can't have access to because they're hoping to hold that to get that last person. Whether they have enough DNA, now he's asking for DNA testing. So, look, a guy doesn't come out and say, DNA test this and you'll prove me right if he knows he's going to prison. He'd rather just, this guy could quietly disappear if he killed his daughter. I'm with Mark. If you think this guy killed his daughter, this is a rare thing for me to say out loud. I think you're absolutely wrong. And we know that some of you know a hell of a lot more about this case than we do. And you're going to tell us how wrong we are in the comments. Good, because we're not going to change what we think because of what you tell us. We're telling you what we <clears> see. <throat> and this is based on behavior in these videos that we have watched. Now, I'll tell you, this is a complex case. There's a lot more to it than any of us know. And it's probably been so poorly handled over the past 25 years, it will never be solved. All you can hope is that somebody heard something and that they come forward and say something or somebody gets a conscience on their death. Who knows how this will be solved? But this is going to be one of those that forever will be a big deal. I just think that a person who killed his child, number one, would not be bringing it up in the latter part of his life when he could quietly go away. Scott, what do you got? Uh, I see. And I see what you're saying, Chase. And my thing originally was that they thought that, that Burke did it. Yeah. And that's why she wrote the letter. Yes. But I, I, would, I didn't think about them going down there and like doing a whole scene about it. I think they did that before they found, I was under the impression that they, she wrote the letter before they found the child. And because when the cops showed up, they had the letter. So that, that's what I thought happened. And I can't imagine a parent doing that to a child who's even, you know, who's passed away. I can't, I can't imagine them, the grief they would be in. Her I don't under. think they, they touched her. In that hypothetical situation, they wouldn't touch her at all. They just wrote a letter. And oh, okay. You know. I thought you meant they, they he did something did to her. Did all that other stuff. Okay, that's what you're saying. Yeah, so that was my original thing. If she did write the letter, I think that's what happened. If she didn't write the letter, then game on. I think somebody broke in and did it. And I was always, always thought it was somebody like a, a workman or somebody who'd like um, – you know, Clinton did the yard or something like that would know where, where that window was, know how to get in and be a little bit familiar with the place. That's what I always thought. Something like a, a handyman or something like that. That's what I thought. But if she wrote the letter and I think I, I, I think that's what happened. I go back to my original thing of, of they thought the kid did it, that Berg did it and they were trying to protect him. So yeah. it makes the most sense to me.